present Clement Freud, Peter Jones, Sheila Hancock and Graham Garden in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Hello and welcome once again to Just a Minute. And as usual, I'm going to ask our four panellists to talk, if they can, on some subject that I will give them without hesitation, without repetition, and without deviating from the subject on the card. Sheila Hancock, will you begin? The subject is puppets. Would you talk about them for 60 seconds, if you can, starting now? The art of puppetry is very, very... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was just about to say very, very, I'm out of my mind. Uh, Clement, new challenge. Yes, repetition. Uh, there are 55 seconds for puppets starting now. The way to write a puppet play <laughs> is to get a number of characters and have them say funny things. Nicholas Parsons at the moment is always good for a laugh. <laughs> I read in a paper recently, I suppose... Must be true. Uh, Sheila Hancock is challenged. Hesitation. Yes, I'm 40 seconds, Sheila, on puppets starting now. I happen to be particularly interested in puppets because my sister is a puppeteer by profession. She is a variety artist and she does an act with her husband consisting of very beautiful puppets. <laughs> and other things as well, if you like to be that way inclined in your thought. Uh, Peter Jones is challenged. Well, she's straight from the point because she says other things as well. No, I mean to still, still. She does them on stilts. Well, that's I nothing to do with puppets. That. Even if you were going to say that, it didn't sound like it, and so I must agree with Peter's challenge because he came in before you established that. And he. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Peter has 21 seconds now with a point for a correct challenge, and he takes up. Frankly, I don't like puppets because I see them as a threat to live performers. <laughs> They have a number of advantages. They don't have to be fed. They can be transported from one place to another in a small suitcase. They don't have to have a motor car or train. And, of course, they are particularly Sheila easy. Hancock has challenged. They you. do have to have a motor car or train if you're taking them a long journey. You couldn't carry your suitcase, as my sister does, from Paris down to Marseille. They don't have their... <laughs> they She's don't got have her their... stilts, hasn't she? <laughs> I think, Sheila, that Peter established that they, he was talking, they don't have their own personal motor car. They go with somebody in a suitcase. And he has five seconds still to carry on on puppets starting now. You can send a puppet by post and not even <laughs> Kenneth Williams can do that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just shook with laughter and my finger went on the thing. Sorry. Your finger went on your thing and shook with laughter. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's a, a foul, isn't it, really? <laughs> It's still That's interfering uh, on the, the bend or something. As you were interrupted, it was a non-challenge. You get a point for that. And there are two seconds left on Puppets Peter starting now. I don't like them at all. <laughs> uh, at the end of that round, Peter speaking, Jones went speaking when the whistle went gained. The extra point, he gained some in the round and he's now taken a strong lead at the end of the round. Graham Garden, your turn to begin, and the subject is how I improved my memory. So can you talk about that for 60 seconds, starting now? You will all probably benefit if I take some time out now to explain to you exactly how I improved my memory. No. It was a few years ago now, I can't exactly recall how many, but I was advised by a friend of mine who's, whose name escapes me for the moment to go and see a man who you have all probably heard of, and uh, needs no introduction and is not going to get any. <laughs> I did visit him on some occasion or other, and he certainly improved my memory, or so I'm told. <laughs> on the following day, I was asked by a friend if I had been to see this gentleman to improve my memory, and I told him who. Sheila, you've challenged. He, he has repeated friend and gentleman, hasn't he? Oh, yes, I'm afraid. I can't remember. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. 
The other panellists' memories were fading them as they were enjoying Graham's story, but Sheila came in with the correct challenge, and there are 18 seconds left, Sheila, for you to tell us how I improved my memory starting now. I feel a bit dishonest talking on this subject because I have the most appalling memory, but I did once make an effort and I studied Pelmanism, which is a means of associating words and ideas with something else. For instance, if you meet somebody and their name is Mr. Goodright, you look at him and... Do now, you'll us, never know. As I say, do tell us how do we associate Mr. Goodright. What with? Well, you look at him and you think, ah, he looks nice and good, so you think of good and Mighty, he's 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 the right rotten. man for me, Goodright, <laughs> next time you see him, you see. I thought it would be much easier to look at him and say he looks rotten, and it would be much easier way to remember. Well, you, then you call him Mr. Rotten, right, when you saw him. <laughs> well, it depends how your mind works, I suppose. <laughs> that Sheila Hancock got the point for speaking when the whistle went, and she's now in second place behind Peter Jones. And Clement, your turn to begin on the subject insurance, starting now. Insurance is a system whereby you pay money to recompense you <laughs> should something ugly happen. Uh, Graham Garden, shall we? <laughs> Repetition of hesitations. <laughs> <laughs> a very good challenge. I can't give you two points, but just one and 50 seconds for talk to us about insurance starting now. Not long ago, a man came round to my house and knocked on the door and introduced himself as a representative of the You'll Be Lucky Insurance Company <laughs> Limited. I was immediately impressed by his honest good looks and invited him in. As he entered the door, he accidentally pushed his elbow through the window, knocking <laughs> three milk bottles, which were on the windowsill, onto the ground outside, where they smashed in a great sea of broken glass. Tripping over a flower pot, he stumbled into the cooker, which was on at the time, <laughs> knocking a frying pan and a small pot of courgette au fin herb. Gentlemen, <laughs> <laughs> Freud challenge. Repetition of pot. Yeah, a bit too many pots, I'm uh, afraid. It was a, it's a very potty story, in fact. <laughs> insurance is back with you, Clement, and there are 14 seconds left starting now. The interesting thing about insurance is that it's only things that might happen as opposed to assurance, which applies to death, which obviously will. And that is something which you really shouldn't... <laughs> Actually, joined actually challenged a half second before the whistle. Peter, what was your challenge? Well, I just uh, hesitation. He sort of hesitated several times, two or three small hesitations, no, which I, I thought were rather wearing. No, I'm inclined to agree with you, Nicholas. I don't <laughs> think he did either. <laughs> uh, it's just a trick of the light, I so think it actually, was, really. <laughs> Clement has an extra point, then. Um, where are we? With Peter Jones. So, at the end of that round, yes, um, Sheila in second place, one point behind Peter Jones and Clement Freud in the lead. And, Peter Jones, your turn to begin. And the subject, the original Iron Bridge. Will you tell us something about it, if you can, in 60 seconds, starting now? Yes, well, I actually went there last summer. It's a marvellous museum dedicated to the Industrial Revolution in Shropshire, where I actually was born. And I visited it with my children, took them all over this cast-iron building, and the bridge itself was spanning the river near... Uh, Iron Bridge, the town is called after it, and uh, <laughs> the, uh, there was an exhibition. <laughs> she does challenge. Well, he is hesitating, but I don't want the subject at all. You've got it, my dear. You've challenged, and you've oh, got a correct challenge. He certainly was hesitating, and you have got the original Iron Bridge and 35 seconds on which to talk about it starting now. Well, there's this bridge with bits of iron sticking up, and most of it is made... No, 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 I'm not going to have her speak in a derogatory manner about this <laughs> magnificent monument to the I'm ingenuity of the Victorian era. I'm talking been... about an original iron bridge in Gloucestershire that's quite different from any other iron this bridge. This is the original. That is the subject on the card. The, the origi original iron bridge. The original. The on it. The yes, subject. there is the original iron bridge. So oh, well, I'm Pete... sure this one was before his. No, I'm afraid <laughs> Peter has a correct iron. challenge. So, Peter, you have 29 seconds on the original Iron Bridge starting now. And in the adjacent museum, there are marvellous exhibits of iron door knockers, ploughs and agricultural uh, Graham, implements. Um, Graham Gardner, new challenge. I think that's deviation. Door knockers aren't bridges. <laughs> However adjacent. 
Yes, I quite agree. In the adjacent museum, he'd gone on to Doorknockers, and it was the original Iron Bridge we wanted to hear about. So they weren't made out of the Iron Bridge. So um, Graham has a, a challenge, and there are 22 seconds for the original Iron Bridge, starting now. The original Iron Bridge is, of course, very old indeed, and can be traced back almost to the very dawn of dentistry itself. <laughs> Primitive Stone Age man had to put up with these appalling stone bridges in his mouth whenever... Um, Clement Freud, a challenge. The repetition of stone. Clement, you have... Stone age is one word. No. Stone hyphen. age is one word. That's worthy of one of us. <laughs> Five seconds, Clement, on the original Iron Bridge starting now. When I was taken to see a picture of the original Iron Bridge, I was shown a negative. <laughs> The end of that round, Clement Freud was speaking when the whistle went, gained the extra point and has now taken the lead. Sheila Hancock, your turn to begin, and the subject is patronage. Mm. Would you talk about that for 60 seconds, if you can, starting now? This is something upon which the arts has leaned very heavily for many centuries. In the early days, dukes and people of great wealth would commission artists and even writers to do some work for them which they would then treasure as their own and indeed some of our stately homes have the result of these patronages to show to us the public nowadays the arts generally nowadays is subsidized subs uh, clement freud has challenged repetition of nowadays and yes, the and the arts. Right, uh, Clement, there are 30 seconds left for patronage with you starting now. I suppose the most amazing example of patronage is a small man who lives in Hounslow who put up his money in order that Nicholas Parsons can get onto radio and television. <laughs> but for him, this man would never have been heard of by anyone. <laughs> but in Acton, Ealing, Hampstead and Haverstock Hill, there are patrons of a uh, very high... Graham challenged. That's repetition. Haverstock Hill is in Hampstead. <laughs> I think that's a very clever challenge. Very clever. So we give Graham a point for that. And two seconds on patronage, Graham, starting now. Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, Demo Freud. Hesitation. I'm afraid the one... <laughs> So, um, Clement, there is one second left on patronage starting now. Uh, Graham, no, Graham Challenge. I'm sorry. Gra Graham Garden challenged you before you started. Uh, Graham, what was your challenge? Hesitate. Of course there was. <laughs> there's another point, and there's half a second left for patronage, Graham, starting now. Leonardo had been... <laughs> Uh, Graham, it's your turn to begin, and the subject is my secret vice. Would you... <laughs> He's obviously in the audience from his laughter. Uh, would you talk about that for 60 seconds, starting now? My secret vice is something that not very many people know about, but occasionally when friends come round for an evening and they sit in the dining room and admire the chest of drawers, I have to admit that I did make it myself. <laughs> Where did you assemble this magnificent piece of furniture? They inquire. Come with me, I say, and take them down to the bottom of the garden where there is a little workshop where I keep a secret saw, a secret hammer and nail, and... <laughs> Sorry. But, no, you challenged yes. it, all right. It, well, repetition of the word secret, yes, and it's on the card. You're allowed to repeat the words on the card, my secret vice. So, it was a wrong challenge, and... Uh... <laughs> Clement Freud doesn't want the listeners to know that it was no, he... No, no, I, di I didn't <laughs> want to stop his very enjoyable account. Of well, you secret. did! Yes. <laughs> for which I apologize. There are 34 seconds, Graham, for you to talk about my secret vice starting now. And my secret vice, which I use <laughs> for holding together two secret pieces of wood while I am putting together amazing works. Uh, Graham, uh, Clement, who's challenged? Repetition of together. Yes. Uh, yes. Clement, you have a correct challenge of point and 26 seconds on my secret vice starting now. My secret vice is pressing the buzzer in just a minute. <laughs> and the reason why I call it a secret vice is because nobody takes any notice and for all the good it does. <laughs> Uh, Peter Jones, a challenge. Absolute rubbish. Of course they do. Everybody hears it. It yes, can't. It's not secret it, at all. I take note of every challenge he makes. <laughs> Quite. Absolutely. Very good Quite challenge, right. Peter. 
You have 16 seconds. <laughs> Wait a minute. So how long have I got? 16 and a half seconds. Right. Well, listeners, if you'd like to send your photographs to me in a small envelope with photographs... Uh, Sheila has challenge. Repetition of photographs. Yes. Uh, Sheila has the subject and 10 seconds left for my secret vice starting now. Well, I'm damned if I'm going to tell you, because if I do, it'll no longer be a secret. And I enjoy it very much, and I'm not going to impart it to hundreds of thousands of people that are listening into this programme. <laughs> Really? If Sheila had more than ten seconds to go, she'd have been challenged for not telling us her secret. <laughs> Peter Jones, we're now with you again, and the subject is, oh, a lovely one, the difficulties I experience in this show. <laughs> um, Peter, 60 seconds and you start now. Yes, well, of course, they are many and uh, numerous, and uh, I'm sure... <laughs> Uh, we can't have all those errs, can we? They are many uh, and numerous. And I'll give him uh, a chance to get started. I was just illustrating some of the difficulties that I have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm entitled to try and communicate with you. I, yes, but I do think you, you did um, definitely I err. did um what? <laughs> you erred in more senses than one. Oh, yeah. And oh, she has have a it. correct challenge in 54, 56 oh. seconds for the difficulties I experience in this show starting now. The difficulties I experience on this show are numerous. They are not to hesitate or repeat myself or deviate from the subject. And believe you me, if you try it for one whole minute, it is well nigh impossible, as I prove weak after the same length of days. <laughs> it is an appalling task to keep your mind concentrated and to talk arrant rubbish, which is particularly what you have to do. Uh, Peter Jones, a challenge. Hesitation, I thought. Uh, I think she was getting close to it. I think your hesitation was uh, equal to hers, and so, uh, in justice, you'll get it back again with 24 seconds left. The difficulties I experience in the show, Peter, starting now. One of my problems is that I'm fascinated by many of the things that the other people are telling us and I don't want to stop them because very often one learns things that one wouldn't otherwise pick up. Uh, Sheila Hancock has shot. lot of ones. Yes, there were, I'm afraid, Peter. Is he um, so mean about my hesitation? I'll, I'll snap in on his ones. Is this a private game or can anyone join in? <laughs> if you have the skill, Clement, you join in. <laughs> there are eight seconds left for the difficulties. <laughs> Eight seconds left for the difficulties I experience in this show, starting now. Also, keeping my temper with Clement Freud is a bit of a... Um, <laughs> I was actually going uh, to Graham use... Graham Gardner's challenge. It wasn't a challenge, it was censorship. <laughs> <laughs> so you challenge the silence, which we interpret as hesitation, yeah. and give four seconds to you for difficulties I experience in this show, Graham, starting now. This is the second time that I've appeared on this programme, and I must say the difficulty is... <laughs> Well, in spite of it being the second time the Grahams appeared, he's got a lot of points. He's only two points behind our leader, who is still Clement Freud. Sheila Hancock, your turn to begin, and the subject is the limelight. Will you tell us something about that? Because we know you know a great deal about it, starting now. The limelight is the word used to describe the spotlight in a theatre. In other words, when you look at the stage and you see some actor standing in a marvellous circle of white light, then you know that he has the lime focused on him. Nowadays, we don't use them so often. They're rather old hat. But in the past, the leading actors were followed around by limelights. Uh, Clement Freud has challenged. Repetition of actors. Yes, I'm afraid there was. And Clement has a correct challenge in 30 seconds for the limelight starting now. I suppose I first got into the limelight when I was arrested for putting marshmallow into a coin box. <laughs> and the police who came made a cause celebre of this mistake because, in fact, I thought it was chewing gum. <laughs> and the telephone booth, which had only just been opened in a touching ceremony conducted by the Minister of State for the Environment, <laughs> wrote a very charming letter to the magistrates explaining that the severe stress... <laughs> lovely 
load of old cods, Bob. <laughs> but he gave him, no one challenged him, and he gave him more points, including the one for speaking when the whistle went. Graham Garden, it's your turn to begin, and the subject is my favourite book. Will you tell us something about that in 60 seconds, starting now? Probably my favourite book is a volume that sits on a shelf at home, and it's called the Raymond Chandler Omnibus, and, can tell, and contains all the very best stories by that master of American detective fiction. It has The Lady in the Lake, The High Window, The Big Sleep, The Little Sister, Playback, his last unfinished novel, and everything that he wrote. I also enjoy his short stories, but of course they're not contained in my favourite book, which I am now describing, desperately. <laughs> Another thing about the Raymond Chandler omnibus, which is... Um, Clement Freud has challenged. I'm sorry, because I'm a great fan of Raymond Chandler's. But he has been mentioned before. Ah, yes. Part two. There's repetition. Part two. Part two. <laughs> and we're into the second half of the 60 seconds, and there are only 23 left. But Clement had a correct challenge, and he now has my favourite book starting now. My favourite book at the moment is that trendy magenta-coloured volume, E to K, of the London Telephone Directory. <laughs> and on page 1361, is the name Freud, which in this current edition is given billing on the top of the page. It's a very <laughs> rare thing, but from year to occasional 12... <laughs> uh, now at last you are in the limelight, Clement. And you have more points, and you've increased your lead at the end of that round. And Peter Jones, it's your turn to begin, and the subject is Irresponsibility. Can you talk about irresponsibility in 60 seconds, starting now? It's quite a long word, really, for me to be given. I'm not often trusted with any subject of this kind. But it is, uh, nevertheless, a subject which concerns me very deeply, as I think all right-thinking people would agree, that nowadays there is very little sense of personal responsibility in the everyday life of this nation, which once held its head so proudly <coughs> in the courts of the world. <laughs> now, let us... <laughs> Sheila, you're trying to uh, sabotage me. Hesitation. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Peter Jones gets uh, a point for being nobbled <laughs> because <laughs> Sheila Hancock sang and then buzzed for hesitation. And, um, and he can fair. keep the subject and there are 25 seconds on irresponsibility, Peter, starting now. So, let us all no. try and brace ourselves no. and look to the future with renewed vigour. <laughs> if we can examine those marvellous events and the deeds of our great men in the past, and try and bring all that experience and vitality that we have gained over the centuries all over the civilized world, then I think there is a very uh, real... Sheila, no, Sheila, Sheila, no, Sheila. No. Yeah. I've got to stop him. It's so embarrassing. He repeated over. Did he? I wasn't listening. <laughs> <laughs> you don't blame him. There you are, you see, you're not listening. You'll I'm hear going. when you hear the program back. But it was, he definitely you think I'm going to listen, listen to this rubbish? You <laughs> <laughs> must be mad. Oh dear. You might go a bit red if you do. Um, <laughs> After that little laugh. Yes, burst. well, all right. Sheila, you have a point for a correct challenge for over, and there's only about half a second left on irresponsibility starting now. Irresponsibility. <laughs> well. I've got to do my responsible job now and tell you we have no more time to play. Just a minute and tell you what the final score is at the end of the show. Peter Jones it came in fourth place, but he scored quite a lot of points. He was only two behind Grand Garden, who, uh, coming back after his previous triumphs, did very well. He got a lot of points. He was only one point behind Sheila Hancock, who's five points behind this week's winner, who once again was Clement Freud. We hope that you have enjoyed listening to Just a Minute. From all of us here, goodbye.
chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by John Lloyd. present Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud, Peter Jones and Liz Fraser in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello and uh, welcome once again to Just a Minute. And as you've just heard, we welcome back Liz Fraser to play the game with our three regular competitors, Peter Jones, Clement Boyd and Kenneth Williams. And uh, they're going to try and speak, if they can, for just a minute without hesitation, repetition or deviation on the subject I give them until they're challenged. And we begin the show this week with Kenneth Williams and the subject is staying power. Kenneth, 60 seconds, starting now. This is to do with stamina, and it's two words used instead of one, which always shows a poverty as far as the vocabulary is concerned. Staying power could also be applicable to batteries. I find when I buy these torches that I get them out of the drawer only a few days later, and there's no light at all. I am not illuminated. And my automatic polisher for the shoes seldom works. The other kind is stamina in the film. Uh, Clement Freud is challenged. Uh, repetition of stamina. Clement, you have a correct challenge, so you get a point for that. You take over the subject of staying power. There are 19 seconds left, starting now. Staying power is one's ability to remain in authority for longer than people actually want you to be there. At the Hexham and District Chip Butty Eating Contest, the winner, whose name was Heckman Dwyck, or possibly... The whistle, as always, tells us that the 60 seconds is up and whoever speaks at that moment gains the extra point. Clement Freud was doing it and he's the only one to score in that round. And Clement, it's your turn to begin and it is beef. Would you talk about that for just a minute, if you can, starting now? In my sporting autobiography, which of course was called Beef, Booze and Birds, which <laughs> related my arrival at Home Park to play for Plymouth Argyle, dressed in green and white, I raced around the pitch. I was centre-half at the time, but had no sense of balance or direction. <laughs> um, it cost 17 shillings and sixpence, a sum which has now been translated in the region of 80-something new P. I'm really not very good at um, the new denomination. Uh, Peter Jones challenge. Nor he would I have any up. desire to be <laughs> so. He did indeed. Um, 25 seconds, Peter, for you on a correct challenge. Uh, the subject beef starting now. Well, it's the name people give to the flesh of the cow or ox. And I suppose if it were just... Uh, Liz Fraser. Actually, they don't call cow beef. They do call it cow meat. I'd buy it for my dog. And well, you might, uh, you might call it cow meat, but it is still called beef. Is so it? he wasn't deviating from the subject on the card. So he has a, uh, another point and 17 seconds, starting now. <laughs> and there are a number of varieties of things that you can do with it, like stewing, frying, braising, roasting, making into rissoles, and actually grilling as well, which is one of the most pleasant ways of uh, preparing this for the table. It's full of protein. It's very... Well, Peter, having got the subject of beef, put plenty of beef behind his dissertation. And, Peter, your turn to begin the subject, a ton. Would you talk about that for just a minute, starting now? Well, that's 2,240 pounds. Or if you're thinking in terms of the continental ton, then it would be 2,000 kilograms. 
Uh, Liz Fraser challenged. Repetition of 2000. <laughs> yes. Yes. And uh, you have uh, 49 seconds on ton starting now. In Cockney slang, a ton also means 100 pounds. I don't know if this has been altered in the view of inflation, but with one ton in your hand, you could go along to the races and enjoy yourself and gamble. If I had a ton of coal, I wouldn't these days be permitted to use it because living in a smokeless fuel area, it is very difficult to burn this commodity. Therefore... Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. Well, other uses for coal apart from burning it. I mean, you can uh, shape it, make it into paperweights. You can uh, <laughs> do all kinds of, uh, of uses for a ton of coal. Of course. I disagree with his challenge and you have 17 seconds on a ton starting now. Smokeless zone areas. Um, Clement Freud. She said smokeless and area before. Yes, she did. And you have 15 seconds on a ton, Clement, starting now. Actually, when a Cockney says a ton, he means 100 miles an hour and not what the lovely Liz Fraser suggested. And driving down the motorway, for instance, doing a ton is an open... <laughs> Well, at the end of that round, uh, Clement Freud got an extra point speaking when the whistle went. He is one ahead of Peter Jones, who is one ahead of Liz Fraser. And uh, Liz, it's uh, your turn to begin. The subject is the things in my deep freezer. Would you tell us something about them in uh, just a minute, starting now? Ideally, I should have in my deep freezer peas, carrots, broccoli, spinach, all kinds of vegetables strawberries, raspberries, ice cream, vanilla flavoured, chocolate, ripple, dog's meat I have, also there is liver, pork, chops. Uh, Kenneth Williams has challenged. Uh, I think hesitation, it all seemed to come to a halt, didn't it? Well, her, yes, it did, her deep freezer was full up. <laughs> and you, uh, Kenneth, you have a correct challenge. You have the subject of things in my deep freezer, 35 seconds, starting now. Things in my deep freezer are not existing because I don't have one. But if I did, it would be full of goodies. And toffee apples would be most important of all. You see, to actually lick that delicate flavour from off the fruit. Oh, I... I can't think of anything better to get me going than a bit of toffee on the fruit. Oh, I love a... Clement Freud has challenged you. Kenneth had too many fruits. Yes. And it was a load of toffee. Or one well. fruit too many. Yeah. And uh, Clement, you have a correct challenge and 12 seconds are now left for <laughs> things in my deep freezer starting now. The things in my deep freezer are cockroaches, most of them. <laughs> which come creeping, crawling uh, out. Peter Jones is I don't think he should be allowed to advertise his hotel on the radio. applause tells me that we must give Peter Jones a bonus point for a very good challenge, but as uh, Clement wasn't actually deviating from the subject, you can keep going for another five seconds if you can, starting now. But in the hotel that I have... So uh, Clement's increased his lead at the end of the round. Something and... worse, I suppose he was going to say. <laughs> Uh, Kenneth Williams, your turn to begin. The subject rules. Can you talk about them for just a minute, starting now? Well, every procedure has got rules attached to it, and games are no exception. The present one is governed... Uh, Liz Fraser challenged. Hesitation. No, I no. don't think so. He was going slowly, but not enough to hesitate yet. So, Kenneth, you have 47 seconds on uh, rules starting now. There are canonical rules and there are grammatical rules. And I think we all know that when we're defining a zeugma or a syllogism or... Uh, Clement Freud has challenged. Deviation. Why? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> 
But he was using it as a figure of speech, and so he wasn't strictly deviating from the subject. So he has another point, and there are 38 seconds on rules starting now. Well, for Clemens' benefit, the definition would be he took his oath and his seat. That is a zeugma, dear. I thought I'd enlighten you, you see. <laughs> and Clemens' voice has challenged you. Hesitation. Yes, I mean... <laughs> Silly so and so, having enlightened him. I oh. love him, I love him, I tell you. <laughs> you rested on your laurels and the yes, wonderful oh, reaction that you got when you enlightened him. <laughs> Clement has a correct challenge, 29 seconds on rules, Clement, starting now. In a Graham Greene novel, I seem to remember, the author spent a great deal of time in a restaurant in Maiden Lane called Rules, in which on a Thursday they served a steak, kidney, mushroom, and oyster pudding. A dish I've always preferred to the same sort of pie. Uh, Kenneth Williams, a chap. Deviation, he said he seemed to remember. Well, he's obviously remembering the whole thing. I seem to remember it was that novel, but it might have been another novel. You mean you seem to remember? It's not the same as, as remembering. You can no, either remember no, I, I, seem, think, I think he was seem. right. No, you can seem to remember, because yes. he's not sure which novel it was. I think he made his point quite clear. So there are 12 seconds on rules starting now. The one that we have for this game says, Do not hesitate one should, under no circumstances, deviate. And also, points can be lost or buzzers pressed should you repeat a word which you have previously... Well, that was difficult to work out, but Clement kept going and spoke again when the whistle went, gained another point and increased his lead considerably over the other three who are almost equal now uh, together in second place. Um, Clement... Uh, your turn to begin. The subject after that is justice. So would you talk on that for just a minute, starting now? At school, learning algebra, geometry, and straight arithmetic, I recall my mathematics instructor saying pi equals 22 over 7, or 3.142. And I said, why? And he said, just is. And I've always <laughs> remembered that this is an incredibly useful formula whereby you can ascertain the circumference of a circle knowing only the radius or diameter thereof. The magic. Uh, Liz Fraser. Deviation. Why? Well, I don't think he's got back to the subject of justice. No, I don't quite see what justice has got to do with uh, the uh, geometrical I did formula they're talking tag about. Out. And you have 27 seconds on justice starting now. For me, justice is courts where gentlemen wear gowns and wigs and often carry a pair of briefs. Uh, Peter Jones. <laughs> That's not a court at all. It's a very sort of low-class uh, variety <laughs> theatre. <laughs> People wear gowns and wigs and everything. It's, uh, you know... Well, it might be to Liz Fraser. It may not be to you. And that's her idea of justice. So we've got to give her her ideas of justice. She wasn't deviating from the subject, and she has 17 seconds on it starting now. There is, in fact, talking about variety, a court uh, called... Peter Jones's challenge. She shouldn't be talking about variety. <laughs> talking You're about right, justice. Peter. That's what... So, um, Peter, you have uh, 13 seconds now to take up the subject of justice, starting now. Nothing is more impressive than to make a visit to the Old Bailey under the Great Dome with the g gold <laughs> figure. <laughs> Liz Fraser challenge. Hesitation. Yes, five seconds, Liz, on justice, starting now. Talking about that court which you've just mentioned... Uh, Kenneth Williams has challenge. already said talking about... Kenneth, no, you have two seconds on justice, starting now. She is blindfolded and holding the scales in her hand to preside. I think that they unfolded. Well, Kenneth Williams speaking when the whistle went has moved forward. He's now equal in third place with Peter Jones. They're behind Liz Fraser, and they're all behind our leader, who's way out in front, Clement Freud. Liz Fraser, your turn to begin the subject. What gives me most pleasure? Would you tell us a few of your secrets in just a minute, starting now? What gives me the most pleasure is difficult to say, 
But I think perhaps listening to Kenneth Williams talking about his Christmas cruise, or watching Clement Freud and his twin, or really enjoying <laughs> Peter Jones, or switching off Nicholas Parsons. <laughs> there are other things which give me great pleasure, like sitting in a restaurant opposite a very tall, dark and handsome man, holding his hand and sharing his muscles. <laughs> I am very fond of food, and this is one of my greatest pleasures. I will start with lobster, perhaps. Perhaps carry on with a nice... Uh, Clement Freud's challenge. Deviation. Why? Starting with lobster holding the hand of a man opposite you has got to be impossible. Yes. <laughs> she didn't, say she, didn't muscles. Muscles. say she was actually doing it. She was, that was, that she's got she so many pleasures in her life. She was feeling his muscles. Now she's got past that. <laughs> I, she felt his muscles and thought she'd better have a bit of lobster to build herself up. I yeah. thought, uh, I thought she said she was sharing his muscles. Yes, she which did. Which I assumed was a first course. I thought it was odd to follow it with crab. No, he had muscles and I was having the lobster, but I was sharing his muscles. Ah, oh, yes, yeah. I am. Well, in spite of the I fact that you like to switch me off, Liz, I'm going to be very generous and say it was an incorrect challenge and you have a point for that, because I always try and be fair. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are 16 seconds and what gives me most pleasure starting now? Accompanied by broccoli, courgettes. I've never tasted any food that Clement has actually prepared and made. And I must say that I think this... Um, Clement, for challenge. Uh, deviation. Why? N not even I can make food. <laughs> <laughs> oh, surely you can. It's a tough challenge, making food. It's a colloquial phrase, isn't it? You don't obviously make food, you make dishes. You prepare food, you great fool. You prepare dishes, you don't make dishes unless you're a potter. Oh, I don't know how he's got the job. I said, Kenneth, I don't know how he's got the job. I said, Kenneth, I said, when you're speaking colloquially, you use these phrases, and it's very difficult to keep going and not be... Of course they do. It's not quite be. acceptable. On a packet of biscuits, it says any complaint returned to the maker. It doesn't mean God <laughs> Almighty. <laughs> so, Peter has supported me. I'm going to put the final judgment on this to the audience. If you agree with uh, Clement's challenge, then you, uh, you can boo for Clement. But if you disagree with his challenge, then you can cheer for this phrase and you all do it together now. You're booing for Clement Freud. You agree with his challenge, so he gets the subject. And he has six seconds on what gives me most pleasure starting now. What gives me most pleasure, actually, is when they boo for Nicholas Parsons. <laughs> I feel warm. <laughs> Kenneth, it's your turn to begin. The subject is the lion and the unicorn. Will you tell us something about them in just a minute, starting now? These are the animals represented on the arms of England. The lion is real, the unicorn is a fabled creature, and has an interesting history and a story which is told by the Master Guard of Arms in the book about this subject, which Liz is Fraser, in the library of the British... Of arms. It's hyphenated, Master of Arms, darling. It's hyphenated. I've been told by EMS who thought up the rules that uh, if it's hyphenated, then it's incorrect. You mean he's thought up another rule? <laughs> <laughs> So, Kenneth, you have a, a point and you keep the subject, the lion and the unicorn. There are 43 seconds left, starting now. And this is Asia Quadrant, and she wasn't that very pretty ancient Grisha Sparkers with the week, or you um, see stuff in the ear drum in order to pass the siren safely. Uh, Clement Freud, Translation of Asian. Yes. I didn't, I said Asia, you great nit. <laughs> Well, then you want to have a referred to, isn't it? Then you, you want to have a little, uh, little. Uh, I want to have a little. Yes, yes. I do. <laughs> and I'll have a little with you afterwards. Oh, you could hardly he understand a him? word he said that no, time. No. I could only knew he was repeating himself because he pulled the same face. You're. <laughs> And I must say, Clement was very clever because whatever word you said, he made it sound exactly the same. And I said yes because it is. <laughs> but none of we don't even now know you were talking about Asia. Uh, there are thirty-six seconds, Clement, on the lion and the unicorn starting now. 
Outside the theater today, somebody came up to me and said, is it true that Kenneth Williams is a mythical beast? <laughs> and I said, no. Uh, Kenneth Williams, a child. I mean, this is deviation. You don't believe it? Well, of course Nor do I, I don't. All right, Kenneth, you have the subject, and you have 22 seconds on the lion and the unicorn starting now. This is the title of a very beautiful story which was written by Mr. Thurber, and it is a magical... Uh, Clement Freud. Mr. Thurber wrote a story called The Unicorn in the Garden. Nothing about lion. I believe you're right. There are 14 seconds, Clement, with you starting now. Once upon a time, there was a woman lying in bed. Uh, Kenneth Williams, this is supposed to be a family show. <laughs> Keeps on dragging all this too. About women lying in bed. And I don't think they had anything to do with the lion. They, they fought for the what's it and chased them out of town, didn't they? All that they currant did. cake and all that stuff. Uh, ten seconds on if the lion and the unicorn show, with guess... you, Kenneth, starting now. And was the subject of a remarkable children's nursery rhyme about going up the hill to get a pail of water. And it said the unicorn fell down and broke his crown and the drill came tumbling off. That was Jack and Jill. No, 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 that's how the crown got its arms, you see. When they... <laughs> well, they broke them when they fell down. Precisely. Oh, my goodness. Well, uh, we are carrying on with the programme, and Clement Wright, it's your turn to begin, and after that we've got the subject of ogres. Can you tell us something about them in 60 seconds, starting now? An ogre would be a unicorn painted in order to frighten women and children. And I dare say Kenneth Williams as well. <laughs> uh, Liz Fraser has challenged. Would it be in Yellow Ochre? <laughs> you, yellow Ochre you're talking about. Ochre, uh, the, the colour is different to an ogre. It was a joke. <laughs> And the audience appreciated with a spontaneous round of applause. <laughs> and, uh, Clement, you have 50 seconds to continue on ogres starting now. Perhaps the most endearing thing about ogres is that you can make some smashing jokes, like <laughs> yellow ochre, or ochre... Uh, <laughs> Peter Jones has challenged. Was he hesitating or was he waiting for the audience to calm down after that joke? <laughs> <laughs> he was doing both. Ah, but you yes. have a correct challenge, and you have uh, 40 seconds to continue, not to continue, to take over the subject of ogres starting now. Well, they are ghastly things with... <laughs> <laughs> Dennis Williams has challenged. Yes, well, he fell about laughing. <laughs> I know he did. He didn't tell you a very funny story, but it creased him. Uh, Kenneth, <laughs> you have the subject now. There are 37 seconds for ogres starting now. This can be used to cover a multitude in terms of the definitions and, of course, months like Medusa, with that air full of snakes and stuff, could equally be called ogresome. I, on the other hand, find... Um, Peter Jones is challenged. Has that got a hyphen? Ogresome. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't matter if it hadn't, because ogre's on the card. Isn't it, dearie? So yeah, what, is your, isn't. What, is your <laughs> what is your challenge? <laughs> Whether wow. ogresome is a genuine word, ah, in other if, words, he's challenging... That, if that is true, if that is his challenge... Of the word. Then, ah, in that case, I give if you your challenge. Hands, you very much. If you've yeah. got hands, and there are some hands, you call you, you're called handsome. You've got some hands, you see. Uh, Peter, you have the subject, and you Does have... Does he, indeed? Yes. What a cheek! 22 seconds on Ogre, starting now. Well, they are mythical things that are used to frighten children and other innocent people, and I think they ought to be stopped from doing this by the RSPCC, if they're still... Uh, Clement Freud, a challenge. The reputation of C. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Clement, you have a correct challenge. You have ten seconds on ogres starting now. I suppose the ISPCA could be asked to look after ogres and stop them being... Uh, Kenneth, uh, Kenneth Williams was challenged. hesitation. Yes, there was. I there are five seconds on ogres with you, Kenneth, starting now. The Greeks specialised in this kind of thing and the Argonauts came upon many in the... Well, I have received a message. We have no more time, so we have to wind up the proceedings, and that means I must now tell you what the final score was at the end of the game. And Peter Jones and Liz Fraser finished together in third place behind Kenneth Williams, who was four points behind this week's winner, Clement Freud.
We hope you have enjoyed listening to Just a Minute. From all of us here, goodbye. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The program was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by John Lloyd. Present Kenneth Williams, Derek Nimmo, Peter Jones, and Sheila Hancock in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Hello and welcome to just a minute. And uh, once again, we have four of our keenest and best players of the game. And uh, they're going to try and speak, if they can, for just a minute on some subject. I'll give them without hesitation, without repetition, and without deviating from the subject. We're going to begin the show this week with Derek Nimmo. And Derek, the subject is Big Game Hunters. So would you go on that subject for just a minute, if you can, starting now? Only three weeks ago in Zululand, I was following <laughs> along the course of the Umfalozi River towards Sislui in search of the white <laughs> rhino. <laughs> Rather curious. Thing. Yeah, in search. In search. It's an old word. Zulu word. <laughs> yeah. I like to sort of touch in the occasional. Uh, Sheila, you what have challenged, and I agree with your challenge, so you get the subject. You have a point for a correct challenge. There are 50 seconds left. Big game hunters starting now. I imagine big game hunters to look something like Stuart Granger in a khaki safari suit and a hat on an angle over his eye, lovely and brown with white teeth and flashing eyes. Derek Nimmer's challenge. I'd just like to confirm that's exactly what I look like. <laughs> no, just, you know, just so the audience will know, that's exactly what big game is. In, uh, in your imagination. flashing eyes yeah. in my car. Uh, in, yeah, very in, your, in your imagination. <laughs> no, yes, I'm just saying that's how I look like. Uh, well, well, nobody else has responded to it, so we'll just let <laughs> that one slide and say that Sheila has an incorrect challenge, so she gains a point for that keeps the subject and there are 37 seconds on big game hunters starting now this is probably a hangover from my childhood when i was very much hooked on h rider haggard's books in which a lot of these gentlemen appeared and i imagined myself in love with them sleeping in a tent in the jungle surrounded by wild animals but protected by my glamorous big game hunter that looked like a combination of derek nimmo and stuart granger <laughs> Derek Nimmo Chan. Alas, a repetition of Stuart Gray. Yes, she... <laughs> Alas, she had to bring him in again. Derek, a correct challenge, though. 15 seconds for you on big game hunters starting now. With my guide, Sifo and Abambi, we wandered along this trail, my, missing by a fraction uh, of green Derek Peter Jones has challenged. Hesitation. Yes, yes, he, he's not very good on these Zulu names, is he? Um, <laughs> there are 10 seconds on big game hunters with you now, Peter, starting now. Well, I think they are probably the most boring people in the world. They can't think of anything to do to amuse themselves except go and shoot things that are bigger, finer, and better than any of them. <laughs> Well, the whistle that Ian Messiter blows tells us that 60 seconds is up and whoever speaks at that moment gains an extra point. On this occasion, it was Peter Jones. And uh, at the end of that round, he is equal in the lead with Sheila Hancock. Sheila, your turn to begin. What I expect of a man. Oh. Uh, just a minute, starting now. I strongly disapprove of expecting anything of any other human being. Therefore, I would not presume to expect anything of a man. If I lived in an uh, ideal Derek world. Derek Nimmo has challenged. Revolution of anything. 
Yes. But isn't well, that she hadn't it? even started. Oh, no. Have a bit of gallantry. Let the girl no. get underway. I haven't got She's much to say. She's the only woman on the team. I'm not going to show any fact, kind of courtesy. She to wasn't actually funny. talking on the subject. She was saying, saying she didn't expect anything of a man. She'd talk about what she did expect of a man. So um, no, I was about to go on to say that I did carry. Uh, that was what I believed in the best of. <laughs> oh, forget it. I might get the subject back. <laughs> that wasn't one of your more lucid moments. Not really. Question. No, I have Derek, to. Derek, I agree with the challenge. You have a point for that. There are 49 seconds. Uh, for you to talk on what I expect <laughs> of a man. What I expect Starting of a man, up. particularly a gentleman, is to show gallantry towards lady members of the team. <laughs> the fact that I don't do myself shows that I'm a right old load of what's it. So therefore, I try to think uh, well. Peter Jones has challenged. Hesitation. No, he, 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 he changed track, but he did keep going. I don't think long enough. Uh, hesitated was what I said he did. Mm. Yes, he didn't break his thoughts long enough to call it hesitation to my mind, so he keeps oh. the subject 37 seconds, what I expect of a man starting... What I expect of a man is to do his duty. Horatio Nelson, the finest admiral Britain has ever produced, off the battle of Nile, steaming down. No, he wasn't, was he? He had the flag up. Uh, <laughs> Kenneth Williams a child, yes, he certainly yes, was not a steamer. So, Kenneth, you have a subject at last. It's nice to hear from you. You have 27, 28 seconds to talk on what I expect of a man starting now. Certainly it would be civility. I don't think any of us can exist in a world where people are shouting and bawling at each other Girl. instead of behaving in a proper fashion. And by that, I mean civilised. All my friends are characterised by the fact that they have the polity of society in common. And I rejoice my heart. Uh, Pete, Sheila Hancock has chance. Do you count me one of your friends? Listen, have you dared to interrupt me? Yes. Just to ask a private question, which could you could have done after. Well, I was gonna I'm gonna accuse you of deviation Why? if you do. Well all his friends have the polity of society, whatever that might be. I'm sure I haven't got it. Well are you very very deviatious? Yes. Right. So, Sheila, you have a point and you have four seconds to continue what I expect of a man <laughs> starting now. What I am conditioned to expect of a man is that he should be <laughs> courageous. Sheila Hancock was then speaking when the whistle went. She gained the extra point and she's now in the lead at the end of the round. Uh, Kenneth Williams, your turn to begin. The subject, my epitaph. <laughs> Have you ever thought about what your epitaph should be or might be? But if not, will you try and talk about it in 60 seconds, starting now? Here rest his head upon the lap of earth, a youth to fortune and to fame well known. <laughs> and talent smiled upon his humble birth, but melancholy claimed him for her own. <laughs> that would be the most superb, the most apposite thing to be written on anything that commemorates... Who's drafted? Peter uh, Jones. Repetition. Yes. Most. Repetition of most. Ah, uh, yes, well, yes. well, he was kept moving about behind me, which, which put me off. That's I was. Why I <laughs> <laughs> Something that you've never He's done. He's been making faces and trying to put me off, and therefore the whole thing is most unfair. I should get the subject I wanted to yeah. say, I wanted to tell him my epitaph. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> There are 36 seconds for you, Peter Jones, on my epitaph starting now. Oh, it's one in America, and the first line I've forgotten, but after that it went, and let your breezes blow free. I held on to mine and they killed me. <laughs> I thought that was very sweet, and particularly for someone who suffers from dyspepsia or any kind of uh, gastronomic trouble. Now, I don't know whether I'm expected to continue speaking on this subject of epitaphs. I have already told you the one that I particularly fancy. I'd like um, it. Kenneth, Derek, no, 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 particularly. Yes, because he wanted to be challenged, and he did. No. So, Derek, you have ten seconds to talk about my epitaph starting now. This is the grave of Mary Charlotte, born a maid and died a harlot. She died, was a virgin at 17, a very rare thing in Aberdeen. <laughs> well, I like very much indeed, and always rather treasure. It wouldn't be terribly applicable to uh, my... Uh, Sheila Hancock challenged you just before the whistle. What was it, Sheila? I think it would be a highly unsuitable epitaph <laughs> for Derek. Yes, it's a very good challenge. <laughs> you have half a second, Sheila, on my epitaph starting now. Lovely girl. You <laughs> <laughs> lovely girl. Eli is a lovely girl. So, uh, at the end of the round, Sheila speaks, uh, speaks, <laughs> spoke again when the whistle went and gained another point and has increased her lead. Um, um, Peter Jones, your turn to begin the subject. Oh, lovely one, getting the ship into the bottle. Oh, Can you talk about that for just a minute, starting now? Well, first, 
empty the bottle. That's very often the best part. Now, <laughs> after that, you make the ship and you have the uh, masts lying down Kenneth horizontally Williams. with all the gear and the string and stuff. There. What's that? It's hesitation. Don't mumble, Kenneth. What is it? <laughs> he didn't buzz. He didn't buzz. Did. He did buzz. He didn't. Yes, he did, did say hesitation. And when you were doing a Kenneth Williams on, you kept going in spite of the buzzer. Well, but I he... didn't hear his buzzer. <laughs> His we buzzer's were... fainter than mine. <laughs> anyway, it was a correct challenge. There are 50 seconds for you, Kenneth, on getting the ship into the bottle starting now. To place the whole thing in, in a collapsed fashion, and attach to each mast are pieces of string. Once inside and cemented to the bottle, you pull the strings taut so that all these pieces of apparatus then are standing in a vertical or upright position. <laughs> then everyone, when the cork is replaced, thinks that the whole thing went in in this fashion, which is, of course, completely <coughs> untrue. Derek Nimmo has charged. A repetition of fashion. In this yes. There's a repetition of fashion, and Derek, you have the subject, and there are 25 seconds getting the ship into the bottle starting now. I suppose the ship that I would most like to see in the bottle, and frequently do, in fact, is the Cutty Sark. And therefore, I have great joy in the unloading the sail. Uh, Kenneth Williams has chance. Well, deviation, you never see the Catasark in a bottle. <laughs> but he wasn't, uh, strictly speaking, deviating from the subject of the car. You can't. You've got your ship in the bottle. Put the cork in. You can't go on after that. <laughs> Can you? I mean, you've said 13... all there is to say about ships putting in bottles. <laughs> <laughs> Thirteen seconds, Derek, on getting the ship into the bottle, starting now. I once knew a very old gentleman in Bristol who was an expert at getting ships into bottle. I used to watch him do this particular task. He would get a bottle and then place into it a ship with all the masts lying down and cement would be beneath these things. And he would... Derek Nemo was then speaking about his ship in the bottle when the whistle went and got the extra point. He's taken the lead at the end of that round. And Derek, it's your turn to begin. The subject now is tall stories. Would you talk on that one for 60 seconds, starting now? The Empire State Building comes to mind as one of the tallest stories that one's ever seen. In fact, I believe there are many hundreds... Kenneth Williams has challenged. The Empire State Building is not a building with one of the tallest stories. It is a building which consists of many stories, but it doesn't have one of these stories. No. It has not con got in it any story which is the tallest in the world. That would, re that would require a, an individual layer to be at the tallest, you see, and it no, isn't. No, no, yeah, I agree with his challenge. He's not explaining it. Well. I, don't I, don't think think it. I don't think it's... No. You have a number of stories make the building high. You yes. don't say no, the, it's the, the, the top one. You said the, the tall, tallest. You said the Empire State Building has the most tall story. Now that is completely untrue because the tallest very story. Boring. Yes, very boring. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yes, yes. <coughs> uh, Kenneth, I agree with your challenge. Anyway, there are fifty-three seconds. <laughs> On tall stories starting now. Well, Baron Munchausen immediately springs to mind. <laughs> One thinks of the traveller who ties his horse to what he regards as a sprig in the snow and wakes to find that the poor creature is tied to the top of the steeple in the morning when the sun has thawed all the aforementioned white stuff <laughs> and the traveller is sitting at the foot of the porch. Well, that's a delightful anecdote. Does come under the heading of Tall Story, and many... <laughs> Sheila Hancock challenged. Hesitation. Yes. 14 seconds on Tall Stories with you, Sheila, starting now. A lot of people are forced to live on Tall Stories, some of whom I believe enjoy it, but a lot don't. For instance, families with children, and it's difficult when you have nowhere for the same little creatures to play. It happens. Sheila Hancock was then speaking when the whistle went. On the last five seconds, all the time. She's <laughs> well, it wasn't about uh, five seconds, though. She went for about 14 seconds. And she's uh, gained the lead again. She's one ahead of Derek Nimmo. And Peter Jones and Kenneth Williams are equal in a third place. Sheila, your turn to begin the subject, What I Fancy. Would you tell us something about that in 60 seconds, starting now? It would take me much longer than 60 seconds to describe what I fancy, actually, and anyway, it wouldn't be allowed. But instead of that, I will say that I would like to be by a river 
in my bathing costume with a bottle of champagne and a few sandwiches. Then I would like to plunge into the same water, swim around for a bit, come out and find Kenneth Williams, whom I also fancy, sitting in his little bathing costume on the edge of the bank, dabbling his tiny feet amongst the tadpoles, fishing with a little net, and then I would go off down the road and there would be Peter, whom I fancy, and Derek, whom I also fancy, <laughs> waiting to take me out to dinner because the foresaid bread and jam haven't exactly filled me up. So we would then go to my <laughs> Not upset me about that. She fancied them all except me. Oh, pet. I wasn't really thinking. I was making it all up as I went along. But still, you kept going uh, magnificently with great style and panache for 60 seconds without being interrupted. So Sheila gets a extra point for doing so. Do I so. only get one point no, you for get all two. that angst? You get two. One for speaking when the whistle went and an extra point for oh. uh, keeping going. So you, you've now got a strong lead at the end of that round. And the uh, uh, we now move to Peter Jones. Your turn to begin a lovely subject now, ice cream. Oh. Would you talk to us about that starting now? Curiously enough, I was in Bognor Regis the other day <laughs> and I saw there a huge ice house, a sort of pile of uh, stones <coughs> inside a pile of air. Oh, you are wrong. You're staring. He's actually staring him in the eyes as he speaks. Just uh, a personal uh, mannerism, and you're picking on it, you know. You're trying to rip my I personality nice apart. Person he, every time I say a course, he picks me up. Oh, I see. <laughs> Why should I suffer alone? Why shouldn't you, you suffer? You want to drag alone? me down with you, do you? <laughs> yes. I see. You've suffered less than anybody. I've only got to hey, look, look at him. Mister sits beside me, and you <laughs> say, what's going on behind me? What's going on behind me? Because you've been up to some dirty tricks in this game, and I've been watching I've you at the corner of my eye. I've tried to do it to keep you. <laughs> <laughs> and you keep doing this sort of semi strip tease, your jacket's off. <laughs> the I'm just following your example. He may be stripping, he's not teasing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> just done, done my uh, top button, that's all. Yes. My shirt. Oh. I think so. um, Hello. I like the How sarong you? you're wearing <laughs> around um, your neck. Kenneth. You have the subject. You have uh, 40 seconds on ice cream starting now. This has been the sub most notorious ill-doing, and especially in our city today. People that are selling it in the street, outside various places where tourists gather, at prices which can only be called prohibitive and evilly crooked. I do think that when people arrive in this country, especially strangers, and get um, rooked by Nimmer these kind of filthy people... Of this country. Yes. Nevertheless, it's a very good point to make. Very good point. <laughs> I do think no, thank you. Thank you. There are 18 seconds for you, Derek, on ice cream, starting now. Where is the ice cream of one's youth, one asked oneself? Um, Kenneth Williams is charged. Oh, what a ridiculous thing. I mean, obviously, I... I, 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 I mean, it, it's either... It's either mouldy or it don't exist. But anyway... <laughs> What a load of rubbish. What is the ice cream of one's youth? I mean, does he know this youth who's, who he's got, who's old in a, 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 a pile of it? <laughs> it's a Kenneth, rubbish. I Deviation. agree. Repetition of one. Thank you. you have the subject. There are 14 seconds on ice cream starting now. Well, my friend in New York always says you can't beat the fat-free variety. Hazelnut, walnut and chicken pox. What finer combination, he says, can you have? And no chance of getting Derek fat. Derek Nimmo's challenge. I can't. I believe an ice cream called chicken pox. <laughs> Do you know? No, no, I don't believe there's a chicken pox ice cream. Well, I was just trying to keep going. I know, you did it very well, and you nearly hoodwinked them. <laughs> Four seconds, Derek Nimmo, on ice cream starting. Oh, I do like to be beside the seaside holding my corners uh, Derek, in my hand. Sheila Hancock, challenge He you. starts everything with O. That's yes. true! Ah, yes. uh, you've been hoisted your own pickle! It's a real man! Oh, my God! Did you throw it over me? <laughs> <laughs> he threw water and he hit my bum. <laughs> I knew he turned violent one day. Oh, I wish I'd never brought it up. <laughs> you brought back. it up. The challenge was oh, I grant it. There are three seconds, Sheila, on ice cream with you starting now. Strawberry ice cream and vanilla. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, Sheila Hancock's still in the lead at the end of that round. Derek Nimmo's moving up on her. And what an apt subject to follow. Sex equality. So, uh, it is Derek Nimmo to begin. Derek, would you talk on that 60 seconds starting now? Well, I think Nicholas Parsons has got a very sexy quality. <laughs> I don't know what it is, really. I think it's the way he shams his ankle up and down sometimes, and the hairs quiver in the gentle breeze from the noonday sun, which happens to be blowing rather roundabout. And sometimes sex is oh, awfully quick his mind, and, and I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> But Sheila Hancock challenged you before you got too far. Well, everything. Deviation, hesitation. Yes, and sex equality. Mm. Uh, Sheila, you have the subject, you have a point, of course, and you have 43 seconds on sex equality starting now. Well, I am glad to say that it looks as though, at last, my daughters are going to have equal opportunity with the... Um, Kenneth Williams, the Deviation, challenge. I don't want all this black trapping. Well, neither do here. I. You shouldn't back. have women on the show. <laughs> <laughs> That's really important. That's really it's only men that have the capacity for loquacious and reasoned no. argument. <laughs> Who's got this subject anyway? Sheila you? Hancock's got it back. Oh, dear. <laughs> she has 27 seconds. <laughs> Sex equality starting now. Oh, dear, I'm as bored with it as you are, actually. However, it is very important, I think, that all men and women, whatever colour... Kenneth what... has challenged you again. Yes, because, you see, she said she is bored by it, and then she says it's very important. Now, is she saying what is important is boring? Sometimes, yes. Well, I mean, that, that makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's true. Very, very it's very important you have... that your... Uh... Kenneth, that your heart keeps beating all the time, but it's boring to listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing. point. Good S point. Uh, Sheila, there are 20 seconds for you to keep going, if you can, on sex equality starting now. In fact, it is a terrible subject to talk for such a short time because it is so deep and you can only skim the surface. However, I would think, although I will get lots of letters to the contrary, that there shouldn't be anybody in the world that objects to equal opportunity for women with men. Whether they choose to work or stay at home is their own choice, but I want my daughter. <laughs> what a load of rubbish! Load of propaganda, propaganda and rubbish. <laughs> Well, I'm sure, no, I'm sure we all heartily endorse those. Of course we those. don't. They can't do loads of things we do far better. And there's loads of... a woman in a boxing ring doing Muhammad Ali. That's no. such no, no, of course not. Well, I think if you could find a woman like that, she'd pack them in. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take him on any day. And you never know, it might be one of Sheila Hancock's daughters. Yes. Let's get on with just a minute, shall we? Um... Uh, Sheila, 60 seconds for you to talk on affectations now, oh, starting God. now. Affectations are something, I think, that are used to cover up a sense of inferiority. Certainly they are in my case. For instance, I am apt rather to say, darling, this and that, and it usually means that I've forgotten the person's name. Also, one does things with one's hands, little gestures, and with my eyebrows, as Kenneth quite rightly pointed out, which in fact usually are a cover-up that I don't know what to say, as, for instance, at the moment. Kenneth I am... Williams. Well, I don't think it's fair, Sheila, because the affectation I pointed out about your eyebrows was on another programme, dear. On <laughs> Oh. <laughs> I thought I ought to sort that out. You see what I mean? You haven't sorted anything. I've just confused them. <laughs> so Sheila keeps the subject. 32 seconds. Affectation starting now. Also, I did once upon a time have a very bad Cockney accent. Uh, not that there's anything against that particular form of speech, um, but... Kenneth Williams has changed. Yeah. She's still got a Cockney accent. Exactly. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. I knew. <laughs> Not as good as I did have. But she, has, <laughs> but she has, hasn't got a very bad one, has she? No, she's not doing it on this show. It's when you get her on the phone, because when she starts off, it's, hello, and then when she, I say it's me, she's, oh, hello, she, and it all goes. That's, <laughs> that's the point I'm making, if you'll allow me to continue. Oh, sorry. She <laughs> didn't actually deviate from the subject, so there are 25 seconds affectation, Sheila, starting now. Kenneth has practically taken the words from my mouth. I went to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, and in the process, I eliminated some of my vowel sounds. But the ones that I substituted are inclined to be a bit like that occasionally. But when somebody like Kenneth or Derek or Peter phones me up, he is quite right. I do say, hello. <laughs> and then when I discover it's them, I say, oh, good, it's you. What are you phoning for at this time? And I go on a bit like that. <laughs> I 
Ah, well, I see you received a message that we have no more time, so I now must give you the final score because we've come to the end of the game. Well, Peter Jones finished in fourth place this week. He was a little way behind Kenneth Williams, and they were only just a little way behind Derek Nimmo, who was quite a long way behind this week's winner of Just a Minute, who's returned to triumph, Sheila Hancock. <laughs> So, an apt winner, an apt finish to this particular game, which we do hope you've enjoyed, the fun, the games, and the erudition, and the comments. From all of us here, goodbye. Chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The program was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by John Lloyd. present Clement Freud, Peter Jones, Amy MacDonald and Patrick Moore in just a minute. And as the minute walls fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you very much. Hello and uh, welcome to Just a Minute. And uh, as you've just heard, we welcome Patrick Moore, who's going to try and play the game this week with two of our regulars and somebody who's fairly regular, Amy MacDonald. And we'll ask them to talk again, if they can, for just a minute on some subject that I will give them without hesitation, repetition or deviating from the subject. And begin the show with our oldest regular, Clement Freud. The subject, Clement, is how to stop snoring. Can you tell us something about that in 60 seconds, starting now? In order to stop snoring, you have to start snoring which is comparatively easy if you block your nostrils with cotton wool or old pieces of newspaper and ideally clamp a handkerchief between your teeth or perhaps force it down your gullet. You then stop snoring quite simply by removing these impedimenta and you will become a very much more worthwhile person. Um, uh, Amy McDonald has challenged. Uh, hesitation, he went, um. And if you stuffed all that up your nostrils and the handkerchief down your gullet, you really would never be able to do anything again. <laughs> so why didn't you challenge on that, Peter? Well, I thought I'd give him a inch or whatever they say, you know. Yes, give him a, give him a chance, a little bit of encouragement. Yes. Amy McDonald, I agree with your challenge, so you get a point for that. You take over the subject of how to stop snoring. There are 34 seconds left and you start now. I'm just, I'm still, oh, sorry, no, wait, uh, can I start again? Morris. Hesitation, deviation, and everything else, hesitation. No, hesitation. I, I started, actually. I know, and that oh, was yeah. hesitation. And you have played the game quite oh, a lot now. I couldn't help it, Darren, I started. I know, but that's what the game's all about, isn't it? Yes, but that's an impediment. I don't think you ought to penalise. <laughs> I think that uh, Patrick has a legitimate challenge, and he has a point for that, and he takes over the subject. There are 31 seconds left, Patrick, and the subject is how to stop snoring starting now. When you consider how to stop snoring, the first thing to remember is to decide whether, in fact, you so you yourself do it. And uh, Amy McDonald challenged. He did what I did. Yes, I know. <laughs> but you see, having let him get it, now you got back again. And th 25 seconds on but how to... I've got it back, have I? Yes, you've got it back, <clears throat> yes. How to stop snoring, starting now. I'm still trying to figure out a way to stop the man upstairs from snoring. This is awfully embarrassing because I have never met him, but he keeps me awake night after every other time of And day uh, Peter Jones challenged. I was too quick on the draw. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I have, you, you thought I was going to say night yes, after I night. Did. Yes, I, I didn't. Must admit, uh -huh. I did, did I cross did. my mind. So you get <laughs> another point for an incorrect challenge, and you have uh, 13 seconds on how to stop snoring starting now. It's terribly boring, you see, because, and I feel it's so unfair, simply because... Uh, Patrick. Yes, Patrick. There are seven seconds on how to stop snoring, starting now. Put that clothes peg over your nose. I feel this is going to be an infallible method to stop snoring, even though I myself have never tried it, since so far as I know, and to the best of my... <laughs> well, 
Well, Ian Messiter blew his whistle then when 60 seconds was up, and whoever's speaking then, as you probably know, gets an extra point. Peter, the subject uh, is cornets, and will you start with it in just a minute, starting now? Those wonderful cone-shaped biscuits, which I remember as a boy, one could buy for a penny, even a half penny. And they were filled with this luscious ice cream, flavoured with vanilla. It was really the most delicious concoction. And Patrick Moore. Hesitation, I think. Delicious err. Uh. No, no, he didn't actually err. Uh. This is one of the tricks they have when they played a lot, Patrick. They go quite slowly with their speech, searching for the words. Yes. But he didn't actually hesitate. But I thought he repeated delicious, but it's too late now. 43 seconds on Cornets, with you still having got a point, Peter, starting now. They're not always easy to eat with style, because if the sun is shining brightly, they're apt to drip. Uh, Clement Freud. Deviation, the sun doesn't shine in cinemas. He never said he was in a cinema. <laughs> <laughs> I imagined it was in a cinema. Uh, I imagined it was on the beach. You oh, see, did you? can always imagine where it's like. I'm uh, sorry. It might have... I was asleep. <laughs> Didn't he talk about cinemas? No, he never said cinemas. <laughs> He's still working out how to stop snoring. The um, 35 seconds, Peter, on Cornets with you starting now. It was, in fact, at Mr. Ellis's shop in High Street, Wem, Shropshire. And there they manufactured it in a small shop at the very back. And when one... Uh, Clement Freud. Repetition of shop. Yes, there was Clement, and uh, you have 25 seconds now to talk about cornets starting now. I always remember a very attractive usherette called Emma who worked in a cinema where they were showing a film called Kind Hearts and Cornets, which she saw <laughs> in the interval with all sorts of flavours at prices from 2p up to 12 shillings and 9 pence. Um, Patrick. Uh, kind Hearts and Cornets were shown in the, in the days of the old coinage. It wasn't p, it was d. Yes, when it was originally shown. <laughs> Patrick, you have a point and you have nine seconds starting now. There are, of course, all kinds of cornets. There are ice cream cornets and there are cornets which are played in bands. Uh, Peter Jones' challenge. Hesitation. Uh, no, not quite. He goes too quick for that. There are three seconds <laughs> <laughs> on cornets starting now. And when you listen to a military orchestra marching in state down the... Oh, Patrick Moore is uh, showing his paces. He's increased his lead at the end of that round. And uh, uh, Patrick, it's your turn to begin. The subject is black holes. Will you talk about those in just a minute, starting now? Talking about black holes in just a minute is not really an easy task. It would take me a long time, indeed, to describe these remarkable features in any detail whatsoever. Because if you look up into the sky, thousands or even millions of light years away, and you try and find a black hole, you will find this is impossible because you cannot... Clement Freud, a chance. Repetition of find. Yes, you were finding too yes, much up there, I'm afraid, Patrick. Uh, uh, Clement, there are 43 seconds left, and the subject's black holes starting now. If you find it very difficult to stop snoring, then by far the best way is to put cotton wool up those black holes known... <laughs> <laughs> Peter Jones has challenged. He's deviating. Why? Well, he's uh, talking about how to stop snoring. Admittedly, no. he dragged in the word black holes. And, I'm, that, and to be fair to him, he dragged it in just before you pressed your buzzer. And the audit, the, one person in the audience agrees. <laughs> uh, Clement, a wrong challenge. You have a point. There are another 35 seconds on black holes starting now. All towns called Calcutta have black holes, <laughs> where the most awful things happen to people of whom better would be expected. But in the year 1793 in the Indian subcontinent, which is now enjoyed <coughs> chance among... Yes, I agree, yes. He was really searching there, wasn't he? Fifteen seconds on the black holes, Patrick, starting now. Through the telescope and my own observatory, I have yet to see any of these extraordinary things, simply and merely because they are beyond... <laughs> Um, Amy MacDonald, it's your turn to begin. The subject is the international date line. I know you've had a, a lot of dates in your time, but would you talk about the international date line starting now? Well, the international date line usually begins with R. <laughs> no, no, I was... Oh, no, no. It wasn't, it was, it wasn't an er, it was an R. R was an R. <laughs> it was a, an R and an er are the same thing, they hesitate. You don't have to say R. R or er, you just have to pause, that's hesitation. Yeah, but I wasn't, well, that's R is human. 
and to err... <laughs> and to err is inhuman. In, uh, well, and, uh, a petty challenge, I think, for anybody who's in a commanding lead, I mean it. And... <laughs> oh, you do make me feel frightful. I withdraw. No, you do not withdraw, Patrick. If you knew how, how, how wicked the regular players of the game are, which includes Peter Jones, you would know that n anything, no quarter's given in this game. And you're not giving any, and uh, Amy's played it more often than you, so it's correct. You have 54 seconds on the international dateline starting now. The international date line is something that runs on the other side of the world. It goes from north to south or in the other direction. Uh, Clement Freud, a challenge. Deviation. Why? Well, this program goes out on the other side of the world and people will be confused. <laughs> That was a very good challenge, but he wasn't deviating from the subject, so give Clement a point for his challenge, and Patrick keeps the subject, and there are uh, 48 seconds left starting now. It does not, in fact, go to any uh, inhabited countries. Uh, Clement Freud challenge. Repetition of in fact. Yes. yes. I'm afraid it was, Patrick. There are 46 seconds, Clement, the international dateline starting now. One of the places the international dateline almost hits is Fiji. And whenever I pass that island on the way to either San Francisco or Tokyo, depending which direction the plane decides to fly in, and also what sort uh, of Peter Jones, a challenge. The plane doesn't make a decision of that no. kind. <laughs> Even when the automatic pilot's on, someone's right. already... Yes, I quite agree, Peter. But it does illustrate how difficult it is to keep going once you start in this game. 30 seconds, the international date line, Peter, starting now. It is one of the most difficult things to explain or have explained to one. Uh, Patrick, no. 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 Explain. no, he said explain and have explained. Yes, was I know he did. I thought, only, only I, I, I thought I, might get, I, I might get away with it. <laughs> no, that's why God, I it's listen. a bit soon to start cheating. <laughs> tumbled about how to play this game, hasn't he? <laughs> My goodness me, the stars have no... Uh... Ah. Yes. <laughs> They're all coming out tonight. 25 seconds on the international date line, Peter, starting now. You're going along quite happily on a Tuesday and suddenly it's Wednesday. Uh, Amy McDonald, child. That's ridiculous. You can't go along on a Tuesday. You like can do whatever you like on a Tuesday. Mm. I go along happily doing lots of things on a Tuesday. <laughs> Somebody knows what I do on a Tuesday over there. Um, Peter, an incorrect challenge. There are 21 seconds on the international date line starting now. You used or, to be my friend. Are you interrupting? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Clement Freud's challenge. Hesitation. Oh, no, that was my fault. I know that's was a foul. It was a foul. <laughs> We don't allow fouls, so Peter Jones, you keep the subject, the international date line, and we'll go back to 21 seconds, starting now. You are proceeding on a Saturday, and it's suddenly... Uh, deviation, just now, you were proceeding on a Tuesday. Yeah, but he can now proceed when he comes back in again on a Saturday, if you no, wish. No, I was going merrily before. In that case, he's... Now I'm proceeding. <laughs> in that case, he's got to the international date line several times. Look, I was there, Moore. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was. It's obviously another occasion. He's not actually deviating from the subject. He can go over the national national date line as many times as he like within this game. And Peter, you have another point for an incorrect challenge. And 16 seconds starting now. One always has this fantastic experience. That... And Amy McDonald has challenged. <laughs> and that was hesitation. Yes. There are 13 seconds, Amy, for you on the international date line starting now. Ah, oh, haven't I seen you somewhere before? Is what they usually say. Or they can say, oh, oh, I can do that myself. I'm afraid so, Amy. Uh, Patrick, there are five seconds on the international date line starting now. When you are traversing the international date line, no matter how fast or how slow you are actually proceeding... Uh, Amy McDonald challenged. He said, how fast or how slow? That two, is right. Two hows. Two hows, yes. And there's half a second you've got in on the international date line, half a second starting now. Will you please have... <laughs> Well, a lot of points were scored in that round. Amy got the extra one for speaking when the whistle went. Patrick Moore's still in the lead, but he's being caught up by Peter Jones, Amy MacDonald and Clement Freud in that order, who are still a few points behind him. Clement, it's your turn to begin. The subject, Geneva. Would you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? There is, in the United States, an awfully pretty resort called Lake Geneva, where I happen to be in a hotel in which there was hardly any service at all. It was quite extraordinary. 
You pressed the button, picked up the telephone. Um, Peter Jones has challenged. There's nothing extraordinary about not getting service in a hotel. <laughs> But this is one of those difficult decisions for a chairman. It quite it might have been extraordinary in that particular hotel. So I'm going to put the decision to the wiser judgment of our nice audience sitting here. And if you agree with Peter's challenge, then you cheer for him. But if you agree with Clement Freud that he has a point, then you boo for him and you all do it together now. <coughs> saying hooray for the audience. I think it's uh, an even chance. I'm not going to put it anywhere other, but leave the subject with Clement Freud and say he has 48 seconds to continue on Geneva starting now. Also, a man came up to my wife and said, will you extend your gratuity? We had just had dinner. She was terribly upset and hit him and caused a considerable commotion. Geneva also is the name of a city in Switzerland where you can have a private bank account about which nobody knows except the banker and possibly you, if you remember, you have a number which is the only way you can get money in or out of it. And if the exchequer catches you, you go to prison, which is very uncomfortable <laughs> because bail is incredibly difficult to obtain in this day and age. <laughs> Peter Jones is jealous. Uh, deviation. Why? Well, he's talking about currency fiddling, and it's really, so he's supposed to be talking about Geneva. Yes, I quite agree. Though this can happen in Geneva, he's got well away from the subject of Geneva, but onto currency and prison. And so there are nine seconds for you, Peter, after a good challenge, starting now. It gave its name to that marvellous kind of gin, a distillation of grain which is flavoured with juniper berries and is absolutely... <laughs> Peter, it's your turn to begin. The subject, Ibsen. Will you tell us something about him in just a minute, starting now? Henrik Ibsen was the great Norwegian scriptwriter who penned such hits as Ghosts, An Enemy of the People, Little Eyolf, and many others, including Pierre Gint. And he lived a long <sighs> life... Uh, Patrick Morton, there are 44 seconds for Ibsen with you, Patrick, starting now. Ibsen, to me, is always rather a melancholy character. Uh, Clement Freud, a challenge. Deviation. Why? He didn't seem to speak as quickly as he usually does. <laughs> <laughs> Ibsen's melancholy caught up with him. Um, give Clement an extra point for that challenge and leave the subject with Patrick Moore. Ibsen, 40 seconds, starting now. When reading his plays, one is conscious of a feeling of utter and deep depression. It's rather difficult to say exactly why this should be so, except that personally, I never like stories of corpses and ghosts and things that go bump in the night. But there was a much pleasanter side to Ibsen. He gave his name to a star cluster. And if you look in the sky, you'll be able to see it. It's in the constellation of Aquila, not very far away from the boundaries of Scutum Sobiesci, which of course contains no really at all, and uh, it contains Clement also Freud a gaseous challenged. nebula, which is extremely interesting, <laughs> and I can see it myself with my own telescope. Uh, <laughs> and it is known... Uh, 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 Patrick, just when you got to Aquila, um, Clement Freud challenged you. Uh -huh, I'm pleasant of him. <laughs> what's your challenge? This is disgusting. This is, <laughs> this is meant to be a family show. <laughs> so your challenge, please. Some of those words he mentioned. I was simply trying to save him. <laughs> but you didn't. He couldn't be stopped once he got his star bit between his teeth. So, Patrick, you continue on your Star Trek with, after a wrong challenge. And there are 13 seconds left, starting now. The object to which I have been referring is the wild duck. And this is made up of extremely faint objects, not um, easy to see. Clement Freud has challenged. The second extremely we've had. Yes yes yes, mm -hmm. yes, 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 unfortunately. Clement, you have Ibsen now, and there are seven seconds left starting now. He's one of my favourite playwrights, and my wife has performed in a number of parts written by him with tremendous success. <laughs> and done now. I think you were just about to be challenged for nepotism, having brought your wife's activities in again. But um, it was after the whistle. You gained an extra point for speaking when it went. You're equal with Peter Jones in second place behind uh, Patrick Moore. And Amy MacDonald's only two points behind you both. Um, Patrick, oh, we're back to the stars again. Here, Mester's got the subject of Mars here. And it's your turn to begin, obviously, with that subject. And would you start now? 
Mars has, of course, given its name to some famous bars. Do I prefer to return to Mars in its other capacity as that of a planet? A red object in the sky. Uh, it was given its name in honour of the god of war many, many years ago. Uh, um, uh, Clement, uh, challenged. I'm afraid repetition of many. Yes, many, many years ago. Mm. It's, it's very difficult, mm. isn't it? Especially the speed you go, Patrick. Mm. Mm. Clement, you have a correct challenge. The subject is Mars. There are 36 seconds left starting now. One of my favourite post-war songs had as a chorus... Mars, she's making eyes at me. <laughs> uh, Amy O'Donnell charged. Well, that's not right, is it? Because it's Mars. She's not Yeah, Mars. but, but he, he very cleverly sort of adjusted it. Because and it of... was a pre-war song, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Depends but... which war you mean. And it depends how you sing. And probably the way Clement Freud sings, it would come out like Mars, he's making eyes at me. So he wasn't actually deviating, Amy. There are 30 seconds left, Clement, for Mars, starting now. It is also a red cluster in the firmament. Now, um, perfect I, challenge. It's not, it's not in the firmament. It's not a cluster. It's not, it's not red. Not... It's not a cluster. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the firmament. It definitely is not a cluster. It's a planet. All right, Patrick, you are perfectly Looks correct, and I won't like argue with you. <laughs> you don't like a cluster to me. There are 25 seconds on Mars starting now. Mars is said to have been the world with canals running across its surface, building up a system of waterways, uh, conveying liquid from one pole to the other, along an entire irrigation network, the like of which has never been seen upon our own Earth. This was a theory put forward a long time ago now by the eminent astronomer Percival Lowell, who had his observatory at Flagstaff in Arizona. Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. Uh, repetition of observatory. And he talked about his observatory a little while ago. But not in this particular no, round. It was no, in the previous it? round. No, yeah. we go so fast, you see. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was trying to give my explanation about the, uh, the wild duck star cluster, which yes. I was unfairly prevented from so doing. Is this, is this show the right vehicle for you, <laughs> I ask you? <laughs> <laughs> I must say, I was beginning to wonder whether it was just a minute or the stars at night, but... Um... Yes, thank God it isn't the stars on Sunday. That's all right. <laughs> And I suppose you have to go pretty fast if sometimes you have to go back 800 million light years. But Patrick, you had a wrong challenge there, and you have five seconds left on Mars starting now. Mars is not more than a million light years away. It is a great deal closer. Um, Clement Freud challenge. We have had light years before, haven't we? Yes. Not in the <coughs> oh, yes. Mm. No, in the wild, that. No, no, no. Wasn't that in October? <laughs> <laughs> No, it was in the Wild Duck when yes. he was on Ibsen. When he, yes, yes. And uh, there are three seconds on Mars, Patrick, starting now. Possibly. Uh, Clement Freud Judge. Hesitate. Yes, for once, Patrick didn't start. <laughs> uh, Clement, there are two seconds, or one and a half, actually, on Mars, starting now. If you melt um, Cap Patrick Moore. Too slow off the mark. No, no, he wasn't. There's the one second left on Mars, Clement, starting now. Way to mark. <laughs> Well, a lot of points are being scored in this game, which is always nice. Um, Amy, we're back with you to start. The subject is, if you rick your back, have you got the subject? Yes. You have 60 seconds on if you rick your back, starting now. This can be a terribly uncomfortable thing to do, and it can happen by simply doing the strangest of things. I mean, you only have to bend over and pick something up, and suddenly, bang, it goes. And there's nothing you can do about it. So surprised. Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. There's not normally an explosion when this <laughs> Uh, the, yes, I, I think that's a good challenge because after all, she did say there's a bang. <laughs> and I must say, you might hear a click or a crick. I, no, I didn't say there is a bang. I said and bang. Yes, you I did. Mean, I didn't. could say and bump or anything. Yes, and bang. Yes, so that, that is a colloquial phrase. All right, Amy, I won't allow it. <clears> and so you keep the subject and there are 42 seconds on if you rick your back starting now. I remember the day I did it myself. Oh dear, she cried. It was on a stage and I was being thrown from one boy to another. And the boy on the other end caught me. Uh, Clement Freud challenged twice. Repetition of boy. The, the repetition of boy is correct. Uh, Clement, you have 29 seconds if you rick your back starting now. I always remember a production which had... Uh, Patrick Moore Hesitation, challenged. I think. No, no, that's the normal speed at which he goes, I'm afraid, yeah. Patrick. <laughs> it must seem terribly slow to you. <laughs> Was Patrick under the impression that he's being paid by the word? <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
All I can say, even if he isn't, he's giving full value to the game. So, yes, well yeah. done, Patrick. But it's a wrong challenge. And thank you, Mrs. Moore. And um, <laughs> Clement Freud keeps the subject on 25 seconds left if you rick your back starting now. If you rick your back, by far the best thing to do is to go to an osteopath. <laughs> Uh, Amy McDonald challenged. Well, I don't, I don't think it is by far the best thing. No, to do. no, that's open to question. And yes. uh, therefore, it's not necessarily the best, but it is something that you could do. So, right. Amy, you have a correct challenge, and you have 20 seconds on if you rick your back starting now. I landed on top of this man who had both arms extended, and the idea was for my legs to relax down into what is commonly known as a split, and then to be thrown up in the air again and land on both. Uh, One landing Point again, challenge. aren't I? Shall you landed twice, yes, I'm afraid you did. Uh, Clement, there are four seconds left for if you rick your back starting now. But there are certainly medical people who feel that you should go to... So Clement Freud then got that extra point, speaking when the whistle went. He also got other points in that round, and uh, his, uh, his crown of the most wins is at stake, so he's caught up on Patrick Moore. <laughs> and uh, Clement, it's your turn to begin. The subject is hypnotism. Would you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? I do know something about hypnotism, because some years ago I actually went to a hypnotist who lived, he's now dead, in Harley Street, where he practiced in a third-floor apartment without a lift. A seedy man with cigarette ash on his cardigan. He met me and fixed me with a beady eye and said, You are very tired. Your eyes are very heavy. And Patrick Moore is very... Yes, uh, very is quite. He did say that. <laughs> what a pity. We'll never know what else he said if he's getting... <laughs> Very interesting. There are 35 seconds, Patrick, for you to talk about hypnotism starting now. I have not myself experienced hypnotism in any positive form. Naturally, there are many stories about it, and these I have read starting when I was a child, and that is a long time ago now. But according to these uh, tales, there are two kinds of... Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. He did say uh, tales. Yes, that was definitely... In other words, he hesitated. Yes, I quite agree. There are 21 seconds left on hypnotism starting now. Well, I've only seen it done in theatres when the star of the show invites people up onto the stage and then puts them to sleep and makes fun of them, ridicules them, puts them... Uh, Patrick Moore challenge. Uh, repetition of them, is this not in the game? It is in the game, but we're st inclined to overlook right. these little challenges. Understood. No, no, but you didn't know, Understood. and he did say them, Understood. and he went slower than you, so I will give it to you, Patrick. Yes, and he's uh, just a greenhorn ahead by about ten points. That's all. <laughs> And there are 11 seconds for hypnotism, Patrick, starting now. Hypnotism, as I understand it, is one of those sciences which really defies any proper explanation. Very young children cannot be hypnotized, and the same, I believe, is true of lunatics. <laughs> <laughs> I've just had a message that I'm afraid we have no more time to play the game. So let me give you the final score, if you haven't already guessed it. Amy MacDonald, coming back again, did very well. Only one behind Peter Jones. They were both a, way, a little way behind Clement Freud. Patrick Moore surged ahead with another flourish, and he's won. Congratulations, Patrick Moore. <laughs> you've enjoyed just a minute from all of us here. Goodbye. <laughs> the chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by John Lloyd.
we present Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud, Peter Jones and Amy MacDonald in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to Just a Minute. And uh, we welcome back Amy MacDonald, who's come again courageously to play with our three regular players of the game. And they're going to try and talk, if they can, for 60 seconds on some subject that I will give them without hesitation, without repetition, and without deviating from the subject, if they can. We'll begin the show this week with Clement Freud. And Clement, the subject to start the show is Pogo. So will you try and talk for just a minute on Pogo starting now? Pogo is the... Uh, Kenneth Williams' has challenged Hesitation, it. definitely yeah. hesitation. <laughs> he actually had gone for one and a half seconds, so I do think it, it was a legitimate... five words. Oh, do you think I was being unfair? Yes. <laughs> oh, I do apologise. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry, Clem. <laughs> but I'll tell you what I'll do is a legitimate challenge, but as you always love to get underway and get very upset if you don't, we'll show you how sporting the others can be, and we will give you your challenge of hesitation. And you take up the subject of pogo starting now. Well, you do this with an extraordinary thing called a stick. And you get on it and jump. Peter about. Jones has challenged. There's nothing extraordinary oh, about a stick. stick? <laughs> Deviation. <laughs> One of the most ordinary things I can think of. Um, uh, Peter, you have a correct challenge. You get a point for that. You take over the subject of pogo, and there are 53 seconds left starting now. The pogo stick is a cylinder of wood with a strong spring. Uh, Amy McDonald has challenged. Did you say a sliver? No, no a cylinder. Cylinder. Oh, sorry. Perhaps I'm on your bad side, am I, Amy? <laughs> <laughs> Peter Jones, I should tell the listeners, is sitting beside Amy MacDonald, which well, is... No, much... actually, I, I still say a um, uh, deviation. Yeah. No, he wasn't. But well, it's not a cylinder, you see, uh, darling. A cylindrical thing is a thing with a hole in it. <laughs> well, it's got a hole. That's where the spring is. <laughs> It's no, a I mean, cylindrical it's type solid. of thing. It's perfectly correct, Amy. I'm sorry. Peter has another point for an incorrect challenge, and there are 48 seconds on Pogo starting now. And there are two steps, one at either side, on which you stand, holding the top part, and then you jump from one place to another. And very dangerous it can be, particularly on a hillside or an icy pond or other places, perhaps indoors. Going upstairs is almost impossible. Amy McDonald challenge. Deviation, you can't do pogo sticking. He just said it's almost impossible. Pick. Yes, you can't do it. He, you could try, so he didn't deviate from pogo. Sorry, Amy, good try, but it's an incorrect challenge. So Peter gets another point, and he has 27 seconds on Pogo starting now. Bo Pogo, who was a benefactor <laughs> Amy of humanity. I thought, sorry, I thought he was stuttering. What did you think? I thought he was stuttering. I thought he You're said trying to Pogo. stop me talking about I thought this he was subject, stuttering. you know, Amy. I mean, it is, you know, once in a while I get a subject on which I know something. And, and uh, what, did he say, I thought he said P Pogo. So did I. <laughs> no, 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 it was a slip of the ear on your part. <laughs> And you're challenging for the repetition of P. At least she's hearing him clearly now. Yeah. Yes, that's something, yes. <laughs> yes. Didn't he say Popogo, audience? Yes. yes, of course he did. A repetition of P. <laughs> and he, he, he discussed a gentleman called Bert Pogo. Hmm. He said Bert Pogo was a great yeah. expert. Oh, you mean <gasps> Popogo? Yes, but that's the man who yeah. actually invented Amy, that. Yes. Right, that's you what I'm talking about. Thank you very much. Challenge. And you have 25 oh, seconds to talk about not... Pogo starting now. Thank you. I agree with Kenneth, actually. I think it's the rather extor extraordinary... Uh, Kenneth, Clement Freud challenge. Deviation has nothing to do with Pogo sticks, agreeing with Kenneth. And... On the contrary, <laughs> I've, been, I've just been discussing them. She's every right to agree with me. What are you talking about? Not very very relevant. to I agree with thought. Kenneth, however much he may be. Yes, yeah, a very intelligent girl to make such a remark. <laughs> very nice. <laughs> She's chosen the most literate one here. Can you yes. say that again, please, Kenneth? Yes. <laughs> Very good chairman, too, in recognising the proper nature of that challenge. What's, are you feeling all right yes, today? Yes, I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of aspirins and a cup of tea. compliments. <laughs> uh, Amy, you yes. have um, a correct challenge. I'm sorry, no, sorry, it was Clement who challenged you. It was an incorrect challenge from Clement. You have another point and 21 seconds on Pogo starting now. 
You see, I think... Um... Hesitation. No. Oh, no. Yes, you are. Terribly slow. Give the girl a chance. I mean, if you know <laughs> galaxies... Galaxies <laughs> Well, the people in this audience are appalled. There had to be like... <laughs> Amy, you had only gone for half a second, so yes. you were not hesitating. You have 20 and a much. quarter seconds on Pogo starting now. Like I was saying, it is absolutely incredible because, you see, it's so long. Uh, Clement Freud. It's the third you see. Yes, I'm afraid it was, Amy. There are 15 seconds for you, Clement, on Pogo starting now. Pogo sticks became very popular in the late 1930s when a man tried hard to jump from the second floor of the Eiffel Tower and land in the Place de la Concorde, something which was obviously incredibly difficult <laughs> and possibly... Jones. Nothing happened. It didn't happen at all. It's deviation. He didn't try. You see, I suppose this is this impossible decisions one has to make sometimes. So I will ask the audience to be the final judges, because I can't make a decision on that. If you like Peter's challenge, and I don't say because you can agree, if you like his challenge, you cheer for him. But if you prefer Clement's thoughts, you boo for him, and you all do it together now. <laughs> I think the boos have it. Clement, they like your uh, bizarre ideas, and you have four and a half seconds on pogo starting now. Meanwhile, a pogo stick with a woman on the Arc de Triomphe. <laughs> well, the first round has taken longer than usual because they all had a lot to say. They all got some points. And the one who was speaking when the whistle went, which Ian Messenger blows to tell us at 60 seconds is up, gets an extra point. It was Clement Freud, who's equal in the lead with Amy MacDonald and Peter Jones at the end of the round. Peter, will you now talk on the subject of penguins? starting now. Oh, a friend of mine had an extraordinary experience some weeks ago. He was watching them making a commercial in a film studio and they were using a lot of penguins. And he was watching the action in the centre. Uh, Clement Freud, a chance. Repetition of watching. Yes, there was, Peter. Oh, yes, there was, yes. You have 48 <laughs> seconds now on penguins, Clement, starting now. One of the best ideas in the 1940s was had by a lowly film director in Paris who tried to get a penguin to jump from the second floor of the Eiffel Tower <laughs> to land in the Place de la uh, Peter Jones, a challenge. Well, I think that's just as far-fetched, but they probably, uh, the booze, well, will have it. <laughs> well, I'm not going to waste time with the audience on this occasion. I do think he's going Oh, you think it's a waste of time asking the audience? Yeah, that's uh, uh, that was an now, Peter, I'm not going to waste what time on the audience. <laughs> I mean, dismissing them as a load of rubbish. Right. Yes, what, that slipped out. Peter, I um, agree with your challenge. And uh, you have 34 seconds on penguin starting now. And he stepped backwards onto a penguin and killed it stone dead. <laughs> One of the few people in the metropolitan area who has done such a thing. I'm sure there can't be any precedent for such an unfortunate accident. Clement Freud challenge. Hesitation. Yes, Clement, you've got penguins again and you have 18 seconds and you start now. It is very easy to tell the difference between a nun and a penguin. <laughs> because penguins have no Adam's apples and make very different sorts of noises. Uh, also, Amy McDonald challenge. seldom carry rosaries. I challenge that. You, 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 what is your challenge, Amy? Well, you see, on the grounds of Adam's apples, because... You see, if a nun had an Adam's apple, you wouldn't see it anyway, because the thing comes up to here, doesn't it? Yeah. I somehow I would like you... to submit and give it to her. <laughs> I think you're being very sporting, and I think it's, it helps well, me Well, you'd very problem. rarely see a penguin and a nun under laboratory conditions. <laughs> I don't think it's a scientific uh, problem no. at all. Uh, Amy, you uh, have the subject and you have seven seconds on penguins starting now. I don't often take a biscuit, but when I do... Uh, I do... Peter Jones' challenge. I think you've often taken the biscuit, Amy, <laughs> particularly on this programme. As her figure is so trim and slim, I'm sure she doesn't often take a biscuit, so I disagree with your challenge. I'm speaking metaphorically. I don't mind how you speak. <laughs> Who is writing your material these days? <laughs> <laughs> it's obviously not as good as Peter Jones's. Um, Amy, there are four seconds for you on penguins starting now. I really don't have a sweet tooth, but occasionally I get the most overwhelming <laughs> desire for <laughs> Amy McDonald mentioned her overwhelming desire. Ian Messeter went bright red and blew his whistle. 
And Amy, it is your turn to begin. The subject, roulette. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Oh, this is a very exciting gambling game. You have a little ball and lots of numbers. They go from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, uh, eighteen, challenge. nineteen. Six. Sixteen is one word. Oh, thank you, yes. Repetition of teen. Quite wrong. <laughs> no, oh, but, teen it, but, she, but teen. There, isn't, there isn't, it isn't a single word, teen. I'd like to make a small future investment in 21. <laughs> <laughs> it's one word. It's one word. What? It's one word. No, 21 isn't word. one word, is it? 21 no, is not one word. That. No, 21 is made. Well, why, why don't we just add up to 99 every time? Amy, uh, and the rest and of the audience six can go home. Are not separate. <laughs> why not just employ the speaking clock? I mean, if it's going to go on. <laughs> because Amy McDonald is more attractive than the speaking clock. Do you reckon? <laughs> well, I wouldn't reckon your dial anyway. Oh, dear, dear. Oh, who does write his material? <laughs> 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 Look, can I get on with it now? Please? Yes, you yes, can. Do, yes. I'm terribly I mean, anxious um... to get into the thirties. <laughs> uh, Amy, an incorrect challenge. You have roulette still, and you have forty seconds starting now. Eighteen, nineteen. Uh, Peter Jones, a challenge. Repetition of eighteen. No, no, darling. No. No. Yes. She only got to sixteen before. She's missed. She's she missed out 17. seventeen. I thought she got to eighteen. No, no, no she no, missed no, out seventeen. She only got to sixteen. Really? She challenged on sixteenth mm. and didn't have it. Yeah. Do you think it's uh, risky to go on, Amy? <laughs> uh, Amy, and another incorrect challenge, and there are 37 seconds on roulette, uh, starting now. 19, 20, 21st, 22nd, 23rd. Uh, Clement Freud has challenged. The numbers are not marked 21st, they are 21. Not, not on a roulette so board, they're not marked 21st on a roulette it board. It isn't the 21st number. Really. No, but it means the same thing, Dan, just being awfully clever not saying 21. I think it's splitting hairs to claim to be clever for not saying 21 when you've counted from 1 to 20. <laughs> <laughs> Clement, I agree with your challenge and you have 32 seconds on roulette starting now. One of the most interesting aspects of roulette when the gaming board came into being was that they decided the casino must have no better chance of winning than the people playing. And for that... Uh, Amy McDonald challenge. Oh, deviation, that's not true, because everybody knows that the roulette wheel's all fixed. No. Well, it's no, they're fixed. not all fixed. And what Clement said was absolutely accurate about the gaming board and roulette, so he keeps the subject, and there are 20 seconds starting now. Although the odds have now changed fractionally in favour of the operators, for instance, red, black, even, uneven, high and low, a... <laughs> Uh, Kenneth Williams. This is terribly boring, isn't it? I know, but he's not deviating. Amy MacDonald is quite right and should have the subject back. I mean, for goodness sake, she Clement. knows. <laughs> Clement has the subject still and there are 11 seconds left starting now. The support of... Uh, a... Amy MacDonald. Oh, hesitation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's, uh, he had a very tough one to begin with and that balances it out. Clement, there are 10 seconds on roulette starting now. Faites vos jeux and rien ne va plus. Are the most uh, Amy McDonald. Uh, they only say that when they're when they're doing shimmy. Or no, they don't. They don't say that. They do it. 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 Right, Rian of Aplou on that game, and Ken Clement was speaking when the whistle went. He gained an extra point and a lot of points with Amy McDonald's help in the round, so he's got a strong lead. Right, the next round, Kenneth Williams, it's your turn to begin. Oh, I laugh. The subject is records, and 60 seconds starting now. Well, I have made several of these records, and I've always found it extremely interesting to hear the reactions of the technical people backstage, so to speak, the ones who are responsible for such things as level, and the decision whether to allow a recording to go out to the open market, so to speak. Of course, it could go out to the Caledonian market, <laughs> which... Clement Foyle's challenged. Repetition of market. I'm afraid there was. Pity. 
Mm. We were all waiting for you to talk. Gee, I was and... feeling sort of dulcet, you know. I and, know. And rather posh, you know what I mean? Mm. I suddenly felt, you know... You said uh... it's all fast asleep anyway. <laughs> uh, Clement, you have the subject in 30 seconds on record starting now. I've always found the Guinness Book of Records the most fascinating volume. And many years ago, when I determined to get into it, which I now am as Omni Champion, I discovered that going up the service staircase of the Empire State Building had only been done once by the Norwegian Langlauf team returning from the 1936 Olympic Games in Berlin. Uh, Peter Jones, a challenge. A repetition. Of what? Something. <laughs> uh, Olympic. No, he didn't say Olympic, Olympic, Olympic earlier on. No, it's nice to hear from you, Peter, but I'm afraid oh, well. he just didn't repeat it. <laughs> So he has another point in seven seconds for records starting now. 33, 45 and 78 are the revolutions per minute which most gramophone records turn at. <laughs> Herman Boyd has increased his lead and it is his turn to start again. And the mm. subject is lime. And would you tell us something about it in just a minute, Clement, starting now? Lime is something you shoot, and it's terribly painful and green and small. It's much more common to do it with a line, but thinking about it... Uh, Kenneth Williams' channel. Nice what hesitation there. Yes, I definitely agree. And you have 49 seconds to tell us something about lime, Kenneth, starting now. This was a great thing at sea in the old days, you know, when the fellas were away for so long from the fresh... Food, they used to carry barrels of these limes to stop the scurvy, which swept through the ship, you know. And they were all... Uh, Kenneth, Clement Freud challenge. Repetition of you know. I didn't hear him say you know no, before. Thank well, he started you. off. Quite right. The audience didn't hear it either, did you? No. <laughs> Shut your mouth. You're the <laughs> what a nerve they got. Coming <laughs> here for nothing, and then the age of the Um, Kenneth. I'll be... No, no, Clement's got a very strong lead. I'm sure he'll be sporting and let you carry on with limes. All right? Thank you very much. No, thank Clement, not me. Oh, darling. <laughs> and you have 35 seconds starting now. It's also a boon to those ladies who pop into the saloon bar for a gin and lime. They always knock it back with relish and say, Mmm, I could do with another one of them. That's really whetted my appetite. Nothing like that before luncheon to get you going. And it does. It really gets the juices flowing round the body and all the taste buds in the tongue rise, so to speak, to the occasion. A steak and kidney pie tastes different again after the limes. In fact, Harry Lime, who invented them, <laughs> said to me... Eminently <laughs> Dolan challenged. He suddenly switched to Harry Lime. Well, he can, as long as he keeps going, without deviating from the subject. So you can switch as many times as you like. You can bring in a different lime if you like. So, um, Kenneth, uh, five seconds on lime starting Have we now established that Harry Lime invented steak and kidney pie? <laughs> <laughs> For future games, may we take this as fact? Because I'll make a note of it. it, it I don't want you to keep your it. sarcasm for when you're playing the game. Uh, five seconds for lime, Kenneth, starting now. As geniuses often do contradict themselves, I frequently make this mistake myself. <laughs> Kenneth, uh, another literary uh, question for you. George Eliot. Who? <laughs> You surely have heard of Mary Ann Evans. Oh, yes. Actually, the subject is George Eliot, and you have 60 seconds starting now. Well, this was her name for fiction writing, and I think at the time, well, she did express herself a preference for the male nomenclature because she said it would help the sale of the books. A notable passage is where she remarks upon the comfort inexpressible, she says, of feeling safe with a person, having neither to weigh thoughts nor measure words, but pour it all out, trough and grain together, knowing that a faithful hand will take and sift it, keep what's worth keeping, and with a breath of kindness, blow the rest away. It's one of the most beautiful... <laughs> Who interrupted? Amy MacDonald. Uh, <laughs> He's flawed after all the compliments he's given you this week, Amy. What's the challenge? Actually, I think I just did what uh, Clement did before. You know, keep and keep bzzing, I went. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I was right. <laughs> you don't think you what? 
I'm not right. I mean, I'm... Th- thumb slip. I'm, I'm sure you're not right. And Keith <laughs> keeps the subject, and he has another point, and he has 23 seconds on George Eliot starting now. She was married, of course, to George Lewis, a remarkable gentleman, and his work on the French Revolution was of great interest to her, and she caused several emendations to the... Amy McDonald challenge. Hesitation. E- oh, no, 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 no. He, he, he managed to get it out all right. I mean, he did... <laughs> he did elongate it, but he... Well, that's hesitating. No, now. no, if we challenged on that, no, I mean... No, it's just cheating, Amy, <laughs> that's what it is. Well, it's one of those little cheats that they all indulge in, and you've got to find your little gimmicks, and the regulars have got them, and it's not as so easy... But those of us who don't know any long words, we can't do that. <laughs> George Eliot, Kenneth, six seconds, starting now. I really have been terribly put off by these people. Do you think it's uh, fair? Peter Jones has challenged Deviation. Them. I'm not interested in him being put off by these people. No, that's got nothing to do with George Eliot. No, of course it's... Peter has a correct challenge, and he has four seconds on George Eliot starting now. George Eliot's books always seem to have far too many characters for me to remember. We're back with Clement Freud to begin, and the subject is Epicureanism. So, Clement, can you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Epicureanism is the pursuit of the philosophy of Epicurus, a Greek who lived from 341 B.C. until 270. The extraordinary thing in those days was that you um, existed backwards. Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. Well, he said, um, which indicates that he uh, hesitated. hesitated. I yes, thought. I agree, Peter. Yes. The 43 seconds for you to talk on Epicureanism, Peter, starting now. It's something that very few of us can afford to indulge in, since most you of the food... You doing all right? Uh, Clement Freud challenged. What it's absolute challenge? nonsense, because it is the simplest of all possible lives. You, it's not expensive to follow a philosophy. No, you're quite right, Clement. And so you have another point, and you have 38 seconds on Epicureanism starting now. And Epicureanism is, in fact, the science, or following, if you like, of happiness, as opposed to the absence of pain, which is what every other philosopher of those days advocated. Now, Epicureanism in present-day times is sort of connected with high life, good living, and food of great quality, which is totally wrong, because... Uh, Amy McDonald challenged. I He's thought ap- Epicureanism was that thing that stick pins in you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> You're thinking of Aqua, Bill. <laughs> Aquapuncture, love. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I think she ought to get it. I do. All think. right, we, for such a good challenge, yes. <laughs> for the pleasure it gave the audience, and after all, to, you know the definition. And she is a great epicurean. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, where have we got to? Amy Macdonald has been no. given the subject by Clement Freud of epicureanism, which she thinks is aquapuncture. <laughs> so four seconds left on epicureanism, starting now. Isn't it silly? I thought it was acupuncture. <laughs> <laughs> We have no more time to play just a minute. Let me tell you that what the final score was. Peter Jones uh, was just in fourth place, only one point behind Kenneth Williams, who was in third place, only one point behind Amy MacDonald in second place. But way out in the lead was this week's winner, Clement Freud. We do hope you've enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute. From all of us here, goodbye. Chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by John Lloyd.
present Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud, Peter Jones and Andre Melly in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you, thank you very much. Hello and welcome to Just a Minute. And as you've just heard, we welcome back Andre Melly, who will once again try and do battle with our three regular and tough competitors of the game. And they're going to try and speak as usual for just a minute on some subject that I will give them without hesitation, without repetition, and without deviating from the subject on the card. And we'll begin the show this week with Kenneth Williams. Kenneth, the subject fascinations. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? These are the sort of wiles that are exercised by human beings on others and, to a certain extent, by nature upon humanity itself. Now, the old period, which is now known as Victoriana, produced things like a fascinator, which was worn by a lady. They would say, go on, put it on, girl, show them it, and they would do so. Uh, Peter Jones has challenged a repetition of girl. Yes. There was. And so, Peter, you have a correct challenge. You take over the subject. You get a I point for that. I didn't say girl twice. No. If I I've made a mistake, I will put it mm. to the audience. Will you please cheer uh, for Peter if he was right and boo for no. Kenneth if he was wrong and all do it together now? <laughs> so they all decided that he didn't say it and I'm sorry. I wasn't concentrating as much as I have to usually. Kenneth, there was an incorrect challenge, so you have a point for that and you keep the subject and there are 40 seconds on fascinations starting now. It took the form of eye makeup very often as an alluring form of fascination. Um, Clement Freud. Two forms. Yes. Uh, fascinations, Clement, is now with you. A correct challenge, a point to you. 33 seconds left starting now. Fascinations always make me think of pumpkins. I don't know why it is, but that yellow flesh, those orange-coloured pips, and the pie, which is... Uh, Kenneth Williams. Deviation. I see no connection between pumpkins and fascination whatsoever, and I don't think the general public do either. <laughs> Whatever turns Well, he on. did establish that, <laughs> to him, it made him think of fascinations. It's a very bizarre thought, but he's a bizarre fellow, so let's carry on with the show with 21 seconds left, starting now. I also find banana milkshakes absolutely fascinating. <laughs> a compulsive mixture of honey, that fruit which comes from the Indies, which I'm not meant to mention again, otherwise it would be repetition. Milk put into a liquidizer and whiz forth... Uh, Peter Jones. A repetition of milk. No, milkshake is a hyphenated. I'm afraid he's right, Peter. Oh, I see. And so you have six seconds to continue on fascinations, <laughs> Clement, starting now. I know a woman called Maud Postlethwaite who is fascinated by Yorkshire pudding. She comes from Scunthorpe, which is... Well, the rather offbeat subject of fascinations helped Clement Freud to get a great deal of points in that round, including, of course, one for speaking when the whistle went, which tells us that 60 seconds is up. And uh, Peter Jones, we're now going to hear from you. The subject, Things I Forget. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Well, thingy Bob, of course, is one of them, and I'm never able to recall very clearly people's names, faces, or the addresses of the theatres where I am engaged to appear, the parts that I am paid to play, or in fact the personalities of the other performers, which does give me a tremendous disadvantage in the particular profession which I've chosen. And other things I would like to be able to tell you about, which I can't recall, are <laughs> numerous, but too numerous to even... Ah, uh, Andre Melly. A uh, repetition of numerous. Yes, they were so numerous. He repeated it. And Andre, you now have 23 seconds to talk about the things I forget starting now. The things I forget are that I have said one word more than once in just a minute. If I didn't forget them, I wouldn't do it and could score lots of points and Clement Freud would never win. What is absolutely maddening is that he seldom forgets what he said and... And uh, Clement Freud challenge. Repetition of points. Yes. No, you didn't. No, yes, no. Yes, early on. Mm. Which were they? I let it go on a bit. When did she... <laughs> when did she and as I was talking about things I forget, I'm allowed to say points twice as a way of showing that I forget what I've said before. <laughs> Thank you for being so honest, Andre. Clement, you have six seconds to talk about the things I forget starting now. 
I really forget things that I forget because I can't remember them, having failed to get them in my... Well, once again, Clement Freud was speaking when the whistle went, and he's also got that point and a few others, and he's in a very strong lead. Clement, it's your turn to begin, and the oh, subject no. is retorts. <laughs> oh. 60 seconds, starting now. The sort of retort which I'm very fond of is, what did you say? But speak up a bit, and I couldn't hear you, are quite high on my list of apposite and intelligent searching, telling retorts. I knew a man whose name I can't remember. Uh, Kenneth Williams. Deviation, and not one of the retorts he's mentioned. Is there anything profound? Searching or profound? Searching, yes. No, I quite agree, Speak Kenneth. up a bit. It's not searching at all. Ken Kenneth, I agree with your challenge. Mm, thank you. Wake up. <laughs> Let's have something exciting from you on retorts with 42 seconds left, starting now. One that springs most readily to my mind is when Johnson was dining at Oxford and Dr. Adams said, Do you not think, sir, life is often boring? And the worthy doctor replied, Yes, especially when one's sitting next to you. Ah! <laughs> Always makes me fall about. But of course, there have been so many of these brilliant aphorisms recorded. One thinks immediately, of course, of that poor old thing. Uh, Clement Freud. The third, of course. I'm afraid there were. Yeah, well, there are loads of ands in his, but we don't pick him up for these words. <laughs> if he well, starts picking up on these individual little well, words of course, like this, we're just going to find fault with everything he says as well. Of course, it's two words. And is only one, and we don't bother with ands. But um, I do, of course. So, uh, Clement, retorts is back to you. And 17 seconds left, starting now. I think one of the most memorable retorts came in Central Africa in the year 1893, when a native Asagai tribesman saw a... Um, Peter Jones. He wasn't an Asagai tribesman. No, because that's the thing they throw. So, uh, Peter, you have retorts and you have six seconds left, starting now. You haven't got cloth ears, can't you read? It takes one to know. And things like that are the common birds. Kenneth, we're back with you to start, and the subject, William Morris. Will you tell us something about him in just a minute, starting now? A designer, a painter, poet, translator, a man who organized hundred benevolent welfare schemes and is the founder of the Socialist League of Great Britain. One of the most underrated figures in the late Victorian period. I think the lines he writes about the haystack in the floods are among the most moving passages in English literature and I am delighted to find that Francis Turner Palgrave thought fit to include them in his remarkably beautiful anthology. Say but one prayer for me twixt thy closed lips. Ending with that wonderful, over the tender, bowed locks of the corn. Never fails to produce in me emotions of great beauty. Well, once again, Kenneth Williams started with the subject and finished with it. Once he gets his teeth into history, there's no stopping him. You get a point for speaking when it the whistle went. It just seemed rather bad taste to yes, interrupt, yes, you see. Yes. That's the difficulty. I know, but when, when did good taste ever come into just a minute? <laughs> uh, let us continue with the programme, and uh, it, uh, Andre Melly, it's your turn to begin. The subject is scales. Will you talk about that in just a minute, starting now? Well, there's the kind of scales which are concerned with weight, those that are found um, on my legs. Kenneth Williams, the chance. Hesitation. Yes, there was. Indeed. And Scales is now with you, Kenneth, with 49 seconds left, starting now. They are held in the hand of the figure of justice over the central criminal court, known colloquially as the Old Bailey. Now, that figure... With underneath... Um, Andre uh, Two figures. There were two figures, yes. What a shame, because I was dying to say this oh, about say this it. woman. <laughs> well, perhaps you'll get another chance. All right. Scales is back to you, Andre. <laughs> 37 seconds left, starting now. There's the kind you find on fish, and in the winter... Uh, Clement Freud. Repetition of kind. 
Yes. Scales is back with you, uh, Clement, starting... Sorry, not back with you. It's now with you for the first time. 34 seconds left, starting now. The musical one, of which my daughter Emma is probably the principal exponent, is Do, Re, Mi, La, Fa. Uh, Andre Merritt. <gasps> Deviation, it isn't laugh for. No, but, but to his daughter Emery, it might be, because that might be. Don't deviate oh. to his daughter. His daughter Emery's a highly intelligent child. She would never say far laugh. <laughs> well, I am going to decide that because she is so intelligent and You talented, don't have to decide. I'm telling you what's what, mate. <laughs> I know. Well, why don't Just you come up here for a bit and I'll sit down there if that's No, okay. I, I, well, yes, I wouldn't mind the money, I'll tell you that. <laughs> on a very good screw, I can tell you. <laughs> I'm working up to what Kenny Williams gets. You can't afford those trips to Carnaby Street. Look at the tie, the gear. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to know, I was awarded that. Oh, he always did. I was given it when they voted me Time Man of the Year. That went down like a bomb. <laughs> They were deeply unimpressed. It goes down well on radio ties. So um, let's get back to scales. And I believe that uh, Clement's daughter is so talented she wouldn't get her scale muddled like that. So, Andre, your challenge was correct. And you have 26 seconds to talk about it starting now. Fast, so la ti do is what he meant to say. Uh, Kenneth Williams. You've already had the mistake, so it's no good repeating it. No, she's no, repeating she's it. She's repeating it. It was already discussed. It's absurd. <laughs> Too far sometimes. Nonsense, it was... What? You go too far sometimes. In what sometimes. sense? Far, so, la, ti, do. Now, listen. <laughs> um, They're all grown in here. As I was trying to help you... Oh, that's it. very sweet of you. Cle uh, Andre, we're still with you, and there are 23 seconds left on scale starting now. In the wintertime, you want to get in the bath. Get one of those scrubbing brushes and really get down to it. That's um, the best... Kenneth Williams. Irrelevant. De de deviation. Scr the scrubbing brushes have nothing to do with scales. I think she was working up to the fact that she... Working up? That... Look at her! Working <laughs> up! Because like she's dropped off. Working up! I think she's more worked up than she usually is, and you're overworked. Now, overworked up. You're overstimulated, but I'm going to give it to you. Maybe it'll calm you down a bit. Because she was working to talk about scales in the bath, but she didn't get there soon enough, so you challenged before. And, Kenneth, you now have the subject with 18 seconds left starting now. They're like Mother of Pearl on the outside of fish. And you see them in this horror picture. They're always used. They're underwater monsters. Awful things that are going to be scaly creatures. And all this stuff's got to be scraped off because if you buy them in a fish shop, you don't want to cook them with all that stuff on them. Um, Peter Jones. A repetition of fish. Yes. Mm. Oh, I thought I said fishy the second time. Uh, no, no, no. Fish shop, yeah. you said the Stop. second time. Fish oh. shop. Yes. Oh, well, I'll accept your word for it. I mean, I'm a gentleman. If you I say think, this, uh, I believe it. Most important thing is you have to accept my word. <laughs> and uh, there are five seconds left for Peter Jones to talk about scales starting now. They can be tampered with. You can put your thumb on one side while you've got a paper bag over there. Peter, you were speaking when the whistle went. You gained an extra point. You're still in third place with Andre Melly. And Kenneth's just ahead of you. But Clement Freud is way out in the lead. He's going to begin the next round again. The subject, polyology. Clement, will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Philology is the study of words. Therefore, polyology is likely to be multi-phrases, love of but could quite simply also be something which you put into a window pane if you have no putty or Vaseline, <laughs> as a result of which the glass is very likely to fall out and hurt your foot. Um, Andre Mary. And too likely is there. Yes. Um, Andre, on your challenge, you <coughs> were correct, so you have 40 seconds on polyology starting now. I do just happen to know what polyology means and would love to tell Clement it is the study of domestic parrots and was told to me by a certain um, Clement Freud it isn't <laughs> I agree with your challenge Clement and uh, so you take over the subject and you have uh, 26 seconds polyology starting now but if you were to get a domestic parrot and teach him the scales. Deviation, because you see, the subject is polyology, and he's now discussing parrots, so we don't but want no, to... But no, but he did start off by saying, if you were. Yes, we can start off a lot of subjects saying, if you were. <laughs> we'd all be doing that forever, couldn't we? We only got 60 seconds there. We'd be here all night. 
But I think if he only went for three seconds, he should be allowed to establish there was any connection between that and polyology. So we'll let him continue, and there are 18 seconds left starting now. A musical scale like Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, that would be polyological because the bird in his cage would normally simply... Uh, Kenneth Williams. But it wouldn't be polyological if you went there any fowls out of there. No, it certainly wouldn't be. No. It means loquacity, and you're talking about singing. And so yes. I agree with Kenneth's challenge. Polyology is with you, Kenneth, and there are 13 seconds left starting now. Well, of course, it is obvious to anyone. The poly is the plurality and the logos from the word, the study of, and thus a garrulousness, a ability to, in many forms, discuss many subjects. And you'll be pleased to hear that Kenneth Williams is gaining on our leader, Clement Freud, and he's also going to begin the next round. The subject is, what I enjoyed most about this series, Kenneth. So can you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? What I enjoy most about this series is the opportunity it gives for my dulcet tones to be heard, enlightening everyone. From London to Lagos, the BBC transmitter has the power to reach the ears of Polly, Polly, Polly. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned many kinds of audience. Yes. <laughs> ah, dearie, oh me. It's a funny thing. <laughs> you were looking for the poly and you I wanted was undone you, you wanted by my own loquacity. Yes. <laughs> Your own polyology pulled you That's down. That's what there. he done, you see. And you were looking for yes. the polloi. Right, uh, Andre, you were the one to challenge and you have uh, 39 seconds on what I enjoyed most about this series starting now. <laughs> what I enjoy most about this series is finding Kenneth Williams getting his knickers in a twist and being completely unable to carry on because one thinks of him as someone extremely... Um, who challenged? Deviation, I challenged yes. because everybody here will agree with me I've not got knickers on. <laughs> Kenneth, I can only give a decision if you will illustrate whether you yes, have one. Oh. <laughs> no, I can't. I can't. It's not in the realms of decency. <laughs> the um, producer had me on the carpet immediately. Shots <laughs> <laughs> is a fine thing. <laughs> <laughs> Who said radio wasn't a visual medium? Uh, I am going to ask the audience to be the judge here. If you think that Kenneth Williams has got his knickers on, <laughs> or better still, to be fair, if you think Kenneth gets his knickers in a twist, then you cheer for him, and if you think he doesn't get him in a twist, then you boof Andre Melly, and you all do it together now. <laughs> you boo, so you believe that Andre Melly's right when she says he gets his knickers in a twist, so Andre keeps the subject, and she has 29 seconds left, starting now. What I enjoy even more is the wonderful dignity with which Kenneth Williams does. And Kenneth uh, Williams. Clement Roy Chan. The repetition of Kenneth Williams. Yes. There can't be enough there of Kenneth Williams. Williams. What are you talking about? <laughs> Don't allow Give him a point for a good challenge. But give <laughs> no, I will give it to you if I gave it to anybody. Because you just say we can't have enough of Kenneth Williams. <laughs> um, but it was a correct challenge. So, Clement, you take it over and there are... What, there are 23 seconds left, starting now. What I enjoyed most about this series was sitting next to Kenneth Williams, having those wet, clammy hands <laughs> grope at my knee and every now and again... A... Uh, Andre Mellie... Your hesitation and deviation and anything else you can think of. Yes, I've no doubt the audience have gone very quiet, haven't they? <laughs> they were trying to think of something else. Um... What I enjoyed most about this series, ten seconds left, Andre, starting now. What I enjoyed most about this series is being given the point by Nicholas Parsons for an absolutely splendid challenge. I mean, here I am with these three men on this panel who are... Um, on Peter Jones's uh, challenge. Repetition panel. Yes, you got in just before the 60 seconds. Half a second left, Peter. What I enjoyed most about this series, starting now. Well, it's... <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we'll ever know what Peter enjoyed most. Because we're going to move to the next round, which I'm sure will have to be the final one. It's a very apt one. Clement Freud, you begin it. The subject is making an exit. Just a minute to talk about it, starting now. I'm not myself a great do-it-yourself chap. 
and have a great deal of admiration for Hilaire Belloc. Um, Andre Mellon. Two selves. Yes. Making an exit with you, Andre. 55 seconds left starting now. It's something that I'm really not capable of doing. Myself you myself and yourself. Uh, do it yourself Be and quiet, myself. Andre was just speaking. Oh, really? How dare you interrupt a lady? Are you no gentleman? Yes. You're no gentleman, is he? With all the front of a lady I like that? I never made that claim. Ooh, on right. just a minute or anywhere else. Uh, but, Peter, the thing is that Clement's way in the lead and Andre's oh, no. only been on the show once before. And she's I a lady. Want and we want to make a we nice know, I sort know, of rumbustious yes. finish, so I decided to give it to Andre. And, uh, and I think the audience would agree and yeah. we'll have a good oh, yeah, that's yeah. right so there we are so i made a correct decision oh i feel dreadful i mean it's just appalling <laughs> good i'm glad someone else does i'm usually the one who's made to feel dreadful andre you continue with 50 seconds on making an exit starting now you need to be an awfully good electrician because getting that neon lighting all correct is very difficult you have to cut out the words e-x-i-t put a kind of ne and uh, Kenneth Williams. I think a little bit of hesitation there. Yes. What? I would say more than a little bit. Kenneth, yes, I know, but Clement's in the. Lip. I don't want a load of rubbish from you. He's the chairman, mate. You're trying to take it over. He's trying to take it over. He's yes, already interrupted the lady. Andre hasn't <clears throat> been on the game as often as the others. <laughs> I want to somehow see Peter. I want to somehow see over here. She's saying he's right. <laughs> yes, and I would like to somehow see that everybody speaks on the last round. Making an exit, and there are 37 seconds left starting now. You raise your skirts and turn to your host and say with enormous hauteur, I have not enjoyed your hospitality. I have never enjoyed your sex. And Clement Freud has challenged. Reputation of enjoyment. Okay. Absolutely right. <laughs> but I am in the lead. Yes. <laughs> You've been at your lead, but I wanted to hear from Andre, and I twisted Samuel slightly. I admit there are 25 seconds left with you, uh, Clement, on making an exit starting now. Lord Finchley one night tried to mend the electric light himself. He got a shock. Um, Kenneth Williams. Deviation, Lord Finchley, and mending the electric light's nothing to do with making an exit. Well, he might have... No, it's the deviation, watch. dearie. Let's not kid ourselves. Who ever heard of Lord Finchley, anyway? I mean, does the title exist? He's nodding over there. I think it does. <laughs> that wasn't your challenge. You said he was... Uh, deviation, I said, and that's what it is. No, you didn't give him a chance to establish about making an exit. We let him continue with 22 seconds, starting now. It is the duty of a gentleman to give employment to an artisan, which is the poem that I tried to tell earlier on when I was about to inform the audience uh, how Peter one Jones made an exit. Well, if he tried to tell it earlier on, it obviously hasn't got anything to do with this particular subject. What uh, a good this... challenge! Yes, yes, a very absolutely. good challenge, oh. yes. yes. Because I'm in the lead. There are 13 seconds left, Peter, for you to talk about making an exit starting now. It's the third most important thing a performer has to learn. The first being how to get on or making an entrance. Then there's that little bit in between, ending with making an exit, which is perhaps... A very apt way to finish the show, as Peter actually said, making an exit, the whistle went. He gained an extra point, and he finished in fourth place. He was a few points behind Andre Melly and Kenneth Williams, who were equal in second place, but none of them ever caught up or threatened the lead that Clement Freud established and maintained to the end. And once again, he is our winner, Clement Freud. <laughs> We do hope that you have enjoyed listening to Just a Minute. From all of us here, goodbye. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by John Lloyd.